in trouble now, Chris. <laughs> you got me and Julian on either side of you. <laughs> I said I, I just told Julian I'm breaking up the role of women here. I feel like uh, I should swap seats. <laughs> I got more. I got more now. Good evening. I'd like to call to order the May 16, 2022 City of Delray Beach Planning and Zoning Meeting. Let the record reflect that it is 5.04 p.m. Ms. Miller, would you please call the roll? Rob Long. Absent. Joy Howell. Here. Helen Zeller. Here. Christina Morrison. Present. Max Weinberg. Here. Julian Blankenship. Here. Chris Davey. Here. Thank you. Um, has everybody, uh, my colleagues up here, had the opportunity to review the agenda? If you have, I would request a couple of changes. I'd like it if I could move 8 E and F to become 8 A and B, and 8 A and B will become um, C and D, all the other items will move down. So A will become C, B will become D, and D will become E. And if we could do that, and I don't know if anybody wants to take 9A at the beginning of the meeting, or we want to leave that to last. I would like to do that. I would like to move 9A to the beginning of the meeting so it doesn't get short shrifted at the end of the meeting. We'll have a second on that. Second. Motion to um, approve the me. agenda as amended. Motion to approve the agenda as amended. Second. Ms. Blankenship. Second. second by Ms. Howell and Ms. Miller. Did you get the corrected order? Yes. So 9A Amy is going to, excuse me? I think you were just about to answer my question. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, did you get the corrections, the amended Is no, I just wanted for clarification, is 9A going before the new 8A? We'll start off with 9A. Start off with 9A. Okay. And then move into 8A the and B, order. the two with Mr. Allen. Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Can I, um, we have a motion and a second. Ms. Miller, would you please call the roll? Rob Long. Absent. Joy Howell. Yes. Helen Zeller. Yes. Christina Morrison. Yes. Max Weinberg. Yes. Julian Blankenship. Yes. Chris Davey. Yes. There are no minutes to approve at this meeting, so we're going to move into item number five. I would ask anybody who is sitting in the audience tonight who wishes to speak to the board in any capacity to please rise now and be sworn by the board secretary. If you're going to speak on any matter before the board this evening, you are, then you would stand to be sworn, sir. Thank you. Please raise your right hand by the authority vested me, the notary of the state of Florida. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you very much. And if you don't find, uh, now that we've done that, I'm going to turn to the audience and ask, is there anybody here to speak to this board tonight about a matter that is not on our agenda? In other words, a matter that would not be on our agenda that you just want to come up and speak about. Seeing no member of the public approaching, we'll call comments from the public closed. And we can now, I will read the quasi-judicial hearing rules, if that's okay. This hearing shall be conducted in accordance with the City of Delray Beach quasi-judicial rules. The applicant and the city shall be permitted to present their case. The public shall be allowed to speak for three minutes each, or a maximum of six minutes, if the person represents an organization or a group of people who are present but agree not to speak. The city, excuse me, the board members, staff, and the applicant 
may be allowed to cross-examine a witness. The city or the applicant will be allowed to offer rebuttal testimony. Decision to approve or deny an application or appeal may not legally be made upon personal views as to whether a project is a good project or not, nor may a decision be based on the numbers of citizens who support or oppose a particular project. The law requires that all decisions must be made on the basis of whether the project meets the requirements of law, the comprehensive plan, and the land development regulations. Thank you, and with that, we can move on to item 9A, as it appears on the agenda that people have in their hand, but that will be the item we will be addressing first. Good evening, or afternoon. All right, as you mentioned, this was uh, advertised as item 9A. <coughs> it's, we're reading into the record, file number 2022-161. It's a proposed amendment to the land Can development ask, regulation. Excuse me, could you just speak more directly into the Sure. Microphone? Thank you. It's a proposed amendment to the uh, mixed residential office and commercial zoning district within the city. So this is a city-initiated request, and it's amending three subsections of section 4.4.29. The impetus for this request is a legislative change that was adopted by the state of Florida in 2009, actually, so we're a little bit behind in bringing this to you. But the um, amendment requires local governments to fully offset all costs to the developer when there is a required affordable housing contribution. Inclusionary zoning, as this is known, it can be mandatory or voluntary, uh, which uses the incentives to encourage the private sector to develop affordable housing in exchange for, afford for favorable development rights. So mandatory inclusionary zoning is permitted by statute. And the interpretation has been that in order to fully offset all costs. Density bonuses are one way that the state views as permissible to offset the cost to the developer for the inclusionary zoning requirement. So the MROC zoning district does have inclusionary zoning requirements, but there's some changes we're proposing to bring it fully into compliance with the state statute. So this is a, um, a mixed use district with um, trying to encourage a transit oriented mix of residential office and commercial uses in a master planned environment clustering the higher density development closer to the tri-rail station so jumping into what we're proposing a change to is for the purpose and intent we just wanted to say in fewer words something that took a long while to actually communicate so we thought that the change that we're proposing um, describes the intent um, more succinctly and then to section 4429B, um, this is where the principal uses uh, and structures permitted in the district are listed. Typically in zoning regulations, we don't allow uh, or we don't include all of these restrictions that are presently located in that. So we're paring it down just so that it has multifamily development subject to the special regulations that we are now adding to, um, an, to section I. We're creating um, the subsection 5 here or we're amending this subsection five. Um, this map here shows you what the different um, distance um, radiuses are adjacent to the tri-rail station. And I, I can't read that far away. My eyesight is atrocious. Let me pull up my map here. So that, um, it shows the 1,000 foot distance, the 1,001 to 2,500 foot distance, and anything outside of the blue ring is um, greater than 2,500 feet. So, Everything that you see here on this slide has been brought forward from B, where they were previously located in, um, in maybe a muddled way. Uh, we do, um, on the next slide, we're showing, we, we put the distance, um, distances and the affordability requirements into table format. The um, 
only change that we made significant to how it is now is that we referenced a CBD performance standards section, which has no longer been adopted uh, when we had updated CBD in 2015. Um, those performance standards were taken out of CBD, so the more appropriate references to section 446I, which are the multifamily standards in the RM district. So again, this is the table showing how we're relocating this. We just think it's more readable. Staff likes to joke that, can we put it in a table? And we put it in a table here because we think tables really can just get people to the information they need faster. The only change that you'll see here is we add a standard density maximum of 32 dwelling units per acre. The uh, properties that are greater than 2,500 feet, they have the density maximum that they can get to through the revitalization incentive, but we never say what the base is that they can start at. So we did a, a backwards calculation of 20% of 40 dwelling units per acre is eight units. So then subtracting the eight units from that potential maximum, we thought that 32 was a fair, um, a fair base density. Section 245 has findings that must be made related to land development regulations updates. And uh, we have a lot of policies throughout the comp plan that talk about using density incentives in order to promote the creation of affordable housing. And uh, we also, um, these corridors here are um, designed to be mixed use and um, promoting of transit-oriented development around the tri-rail station. So uh, this continues to just support these policies, but in a way that um, is legally defensible based on the state statutes. We do not propose a change to the required income levels. Uh, looking back to the table, the district requires uh, only moderate income if you are taking advantage of the workforce housing um, incentive. But um, we think it may be worthy of board consideration as to whether we should expand the income levels that are required. This chart here shows the different areas of the city that offer the workforce housing density incentives. And there are only two on the books currently, the Linton Commons Overlay and the Railroad Corridor Subdistrict that require an equal mix of all three income levels that we have in our regulations. The others are all very low, low or moderate, or they don't mention the income level at all. So <clears throat> based on the um, median income in Delray and the maximum rents that could be charged for someone, um, for example, picking a column, if there's a four-person household, they could still take advantage of a mixed in or moderate income restricted unit if they make up to $99,360. And then the maximum number or maximum rent they could be charged for a two bedroom apartment would be about $2,400. So while this does serve a certain segment of the population, there's people who earn far less that are not really, it would not be able to take advantage of any development that happens in MROC. And this is just another uh, set of statistics. So um, nationally, there has been a trend of, um, there's been a decline in the uh, rent to income ratios when you factor in people who are higher wage earners, but for folks who are making less than the moderate income category, there's been a really significant dip in affordability. So as you can see from the chart, um, in, in 2018 for folks that are earning um, between 2018 and the present, there's been about a 13% uh, percent increase in people who are rent burdened for the folks making under 50,000. For those making 50 to 75, it's increased by about 5%. And for the 35 to 75,000 category, combining those two, um, it's increased by about 10%. So there's certainly a need to ensure that uh, housing products that are accessible to all are provided. And this is just another chart. Uh, to continue to go into the need for income diversity from a study that was recently done for Palm Beach County. This is countywide, and as you can see, for low income, moderate income, and middle income renters, there's a significant gap in affordability uh, between what you could afford at that wage and what you actually have to pay for the average rents. And uh, just as a quick point of clarification, our um, regulations re define workforce housing units. That's the term that our code has designed, has um, 
for some reason adopted. So affordable housing and workforce housing are generally considered synonymous. Affordable housing tends to be a little more broad than workforce housing, uh, whereas it does provide different income metrics for affordability, whereas workforce housing is just, um, it's, it's a little bit less specific. And then attainable housing, um, is more even more broadly inclusive. It would talk about different types of housing options related to ownership, type, size, et cetera, um, just to give people of all incomes and preferences access. So this amendment would not be touching on the attainable housing. We do have some um, amendments that we're hoping to bring up before the board down the road after we do a housing study to really understand what kinds of, of um, housing types could appropriately be introduced um, to the market. but. Um, so this is addressing that specific workforce housing um, component. We brought this to the Affordable Housing Committee last week, and they made the recommendation that the uh, income categories be expanded to require a very low, low and moderate income for those taking advantage of the workforce bonus. And then um, they thought that the required percentage should not be 20%, but 30% of the units should be affordable. So at this point, I can take any questions, um, and but that concludes my presentation. Excuse me. I'll turn to my colleagues on the board and ask, does anybody have any questions, comments? I have a question. Mr. Weinberg, please. Thank you. Mrs. R, what um, possible incentives would be given to developers <laughs> Uh, to follow the recommendations of the house of uh, the workforce housing uh, work group so it would have to be up to the planning and zoning board if you wanted to recommend that we expand it you would that recommendation would be passed on to commission and then commission would of course be the final deciding body as to whether or not we wanted to expand the income categories or even expand the percentage that's required um, but any recommendation you have would be what would be going into that or you could even um, amend your motions as the recommendation is that currently included in the ordinance the or that's just a recommendation currently it requires 20 percent moderate if you want to take advantage of the density bonus um, staff was recommending consideration of all three income categories very low low and moderate instead of just moderate and the affordable housing committee advisory committee recommended the 30 percent instead of 20 percent and we staff hadn't looked into that yet to analyze how that could work um, for the base densities and maximum densities mm -hmm. but okay thanks ms morrison um thank you elizabeth um, if the intent of the state law is to make the developers economically whole through incentives, how could that be achieved with 30 percent um, requirement? That would be certainly something to consider. I don't know that I've seen a 30 percent requirement anywhere. I mean, we have two districts that are one district, the Ara Del Rey, which is not even a district, it's an overlay right. that requires the 25%, but they're only at the moderate income. So I don't know that I'd have to do more research to know whether or not anyone else is requiring the 30% and has done it successfully without a legal challenge. I'm just not sure it's economically feasible to build new with setting aside 30%, mm -hmm. just, just a thought. Um, the changes that are being recommended, mm -hmm. do they all meet the state requirement? To they do. They do. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Blankenship? Um, I guess my only question would be, uh, I realize this is part of the incentive program. Mm -hmm. is, is it possible? I know it's not like that yet currently, but would it be possible at some point if the commission could take that away so it's required of any new development to offer workforce housing other than it just being part of an incentive program if they do it then they get uh, you know bonus height or density something like that we would have to look at how it could be done so that it wasn't considered um, not offsetting the cost to the developer I know other jurisdictions and other other um, other states have done things whereas if you rezone you would have to do a percentage of affordable housing I don't know if that meshes with Florida law but it is certainly something that they could look at later um, and to expand where you can get that but it would certainly have to meet that criteria of fully offsetting the cost to the developer for providing those units 
Thank you. And uh, I would just say, in my opinion, that you know I, I agree with the recommendations by the Affordable Housing Committee, um, with the exception of, I'm not exactly positive that the 30% is not onerous. Um, and so, you know, I would say I would go with the, of course, the um, income levels, and I'm not sure that 30% is good. I don't know if 20% is just, just better, and it's not onerous on the developer, but I mean, I could go either way. Thank you. Ms. Howell, thank you, well, Ms. Blankenship. I'd really like to hear from our representative, too. That's uh, why we're waiting to get him <laughs> uh, to the committee, but, um, but I support Everybody's him. spoken now, except him. <laughs> except him, right, exactly. Uh, but I also think that the point you made is very good, Julian, which is I I'd love to see at least some sort of moderate income requirement, not as an offset necessarily for greater heightened density, mm -hmm. but just as part of our planning and our housing mix here. So I don't know if that's feasible, but it, I think it would be an interesting goal to look at. Yeah. Thank you. So, Mr. I've got your tongue over there. <clears throat> so, I, as you know, I'm on that affordable housing committee, and there was a long discussion. Uh, staff presented essentially the same report, and the committee um, reviewed it and made the determination that the um, because there is this obligation that the costs be up offset by the um, state's bill to the developers, uh, and because there's such a need, an overwhelming need for affordable housing, the staff felt that, not the staff, the committee felt that there should be the three income levels, uh, very low, low, and moderate, that those three levels should be equally distributed between those three categories um, and that the affordable units be, be equally distributed throughout the develop it, development them itself so that they're not confined to say one floor or one section where all the affordable units would be um, um, consolidated into, into one area. Um, they also felt that there should be a moratorium on, on this SAD um, program uh, until <coughs> there's been further study. And a dis the discussion included the deed restrictions on these units for 40 years um, for both sale and uh, rental units across the board. There should, I believe that the deed restrictions currently are 40, a 40-year 40 deed restriction, and they felt that that should be maintained. Because uh, there was some discussion after that about expanding the entire <coughs> affordable housing program to other residential and mixed-use uh, districts within the city as a whole. That's not before us now, tonight, right? but it should come hopefully at some point in time soon. It should come before the board to expand the obligation to impose uh, affordable housing in any uh, residential mixed use or substantial rehab developments that exist in the city. But to, to um, limit it to just this. MROC discussion, um, they were pretty clear that there was a need, and since everything that is going on in the MROC district is basically newly created, um, building with a clean sheet, uh, that there should be an increase in, in the amount from the 20% to the 30%. Um, and that, I think, was voted upon unanimously by the committee, which represents a cross-section of, of, I think there's 13 people on that committee. Not all of them um, attend. Um, Commissioner Boylston is on the committee. He wasn't at this meeting to, to discuss his views, but um, we had, I think, eight people there of of the 13 who, who were all in favor of this recommendation. Okay. Um, from, from my standpoint, 
um, I believe it's, it's at very least necessary to impose these requirements to all three levels. It's necessary to make it equally distributed at each level because when you consider, uh, they didn't show that chart, but when you consider, I think for 2021, the, the average mean income for uh, Palm Beach County is like $90,000. Delray Beach's AMI is, is lower than that but the counties is $90,000. So um, when you have moderate income units only, that range goes from 80% of the AMI to depending on which regulation you're looking at, 120% or 140% for, for the county. So just for easier math, if it's 100,000, and you're making, and you can go up to 140 percent, then that that, and you're only doing moderate income housing. You're cutting out vast need of affordable housing to other yep. residents. And keeping in mind that the workforce housing or affordable housing categories of employees, I mean, you have teachers in no, there, nurses Mr. in there, Zeller. EMS people in there, police, firemen, I mean, you have a wide range <coughs> of people that live, want to live or, or work in the city that can find affordable housing. And, and the maximum rent that Rebecca had indicated was like $2,400 a month. I mean, nobody will find that affordable if you're making, um, even to some- If you're making- at or below the median income in the right. city of Delray Beach. Exactly. I hear you, Mr. Zeller. So, um, uh, I just want to try to move it along because we did change the agenda and I don't want to make the people right. we changed it to. Um, let me just ask, Mr. Zeller noted that that opinion was unanimous by the present members. Is that the case? So, yes, that's correct. Yes, okay. What I would suggest would be, because I have to tell you, I have. I share the concerns of Ms. Blankenship, okay? Um, I would love to see 30%, I would love to see 35%, but I just don't know whether that's onerous, okay? Um, will you be doing research on that before this goes to the commission? Yes, I will absolutely do that. We have a great resource in the Florida Housing Finance Corporation. They receive all of the tax credits that are then distributed to local governments, and they have a great team that can give us some feedback on whether or not 30% is too much of a push and is kind of jeopardizing the city in that regard. Right, maybe the number should be 20, maybe it should be 25. I'll absolutely do that. What I'm just going to say is that I'm willing to go along with what the Affordable Housing Advisory Committee did, but I would want to make sure that staff is going to factually, you know, with professional data, accurate data, review and see, um, because the city is going to be picking up the tab for this ultimately. Um, so basically, I want to make sure that we're dealing with the facts and not sure. people's projections, okay? Mm -hmm. Because if the builders find it too onerous and nothing gets built, we're in a worse situation. And that's what I want to avoid, okay? Can I just ask one more question? Please, Ms. Allen. I, I never really hear what the enforcement mechanism is. On. There's a requirement for the affordable housing, but how long, how is it enforced by the city? So you are not required to build affordable housing no. if you want to go to 50 dwelling units per acre in the 1,000 foot and 1,000 to 2,500 feet, then you would have to do the affordable housing. Right. And then uh, greater than the 2,500 feet now, we're hoping to do the 40 dwelling unit max, but you could only do that if, you, it's at that point that it's voluntary by the developers that they would be contributing that. So the restrictive covenants are then recorded prior to issuance of a building permit. And that's how we make sure that they are, it is, I think that's the step. That's also how the restriction goes in. Yes, and then- So many years. So, okay, and they so work with legal say, to record the restrictive covenants. So let me just understand. So, you know, 
policemen, firefighter, nurse, et cetera, move into these units. Mm -hmm. They're there for the first year. What happens after that? Is there a, does They're it? deed restricted. There's a certain number of units that are deed restricted, which is why it gets recorded before there's a building permit, before they can do any improvements on that site. So right. Those, those have already been restricted by these the municipality or the county. But are they apartment or condos? Either one. Okay. And then, but is there an enforcement mechanism that actually looks over that? As so, goes the monitoring forward? goes through the Neighborhood Services Department, and they receive monthly reports on the tenants and any of these income-restricted uh, products. And leases so, renewed and everything else. Mm -hmm. Right. So one of the recommendations that I made, because I had that exact question, that it appeared that these affordable units, after one or two sales or one or two rentals, sort of fall through the cracks that even if there's a a deed restriction. I asked who enforces the um, income eligibility requirements to make sure that each time they're re-rented, the department gets notified and that they are certified in, to um, meet those income requirements. And so that department does that, the, the one that uh, Rebecca just mentioned. However, I also said that there should be, I asked if, if the developers, since we're doing them a favor in certifying the people that they're obligated to provide, that the developers should pay a fee for to the department to Zeller, and I include that in this MROC. This, that, didn't, that didn't get Traction. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's just stick with the matter at hand. The, we'll take that. Um, you've and if you don't mind, when you get that information, if you wouldn't mind just emailing it Absolutely. to we'll the members that. of the board, including Mr. Long, who's not here, because mm -hmm. I think Ms. Morrison, Mr. Zeller, Mr. Weinberg, I think all of us, Ms. Blank and Chip, would like to look and see what the Builders Association got back to you with. Sure, absolutely. Okay. I just have one question before we make the motion. Um, Mr. Bennett, in terms of language for the motion, if we wanted to carry forward the recommendation of the um, Affordable Housing Committee, but not um, with the 30 percent, I'm, I'm not sure how to word that where we would have staff like research that prior to commission as was discussed up here. So I wouldn't recommend a motion that just carte blanche adopts the Affordable Housing Committee's um, advisory opinion or, or their recommendation, just because it really should stand alone as this board's authority. Um, <clears throat> the 20% to 30%, um, you know, it's, it's right in the chart, so I think just modifying that to be 30%. If you want to add language subject to um, staff's ability to review and find supporting data, um, you know, unfortunately, when you make that motion, it leaves here without it coming back. So you're re relying upon staff. So um, that would be an issue for the board to consider. And I think the motion would just also include that the workforce housing be equally distributed among uh, very low, low, and moderate, if that's the board's um, direction. I want to point out some of the items I think Mr. Zeller raised about uh, the units not being clumped um, and then the, restrict the restrictions on it. It's my understanding that those two items are already addressed in the land development regulations, just not necessarily in, in this provision because it's kind of a cross reference to workforce housing and affordable housing generally. So I don't think those items need to be part of a motion because they're already in the regulations. So what I, I believe I've heard from the board is there's some consensus for an equal distribution among the different levels of um, income and then maybe a discussion about whether it should be 30% subject to supporting data or to keep it at 20 and let commission. It's being analyzed prior to the yeah. package going to the commission. Yeah. That's can fine. I, if you can want I to just, take a stab at it. Can yeah. I just ask a question? Sure. So will this proposed ordinance that was submitted as part of our package 2022-20-22 be amended and, and provided to us, or how is yes, that's that? more of an administrative question. I, I, in my experience, I believe that usually the planning and zoning's recommendation is added to the staff report, but that 
the change may not necessarily be made to the ordinance itself, but be discussed uh, with commission. And if they gave that direction, it could be modified and then signed at a later date. That's correct. We typically add all of the board recommendations in detail into the cover memos for the agenda item to let them know what the boards, the lower boards were requesting and the reasons why. So we will have that, all the recommendations in the cover memo for commission. So like, for example, it only makes reference to the mixed use uh, as a category when you really should make reference to mixed use or a substantial rehab. Let's say there's an office building that they're going to rehab and make into an apartment building or a condo building. It should indicate that it's, this applies to substantial rehab buildings and it applies to residential buildings in addition to mixed use. Well, look, the the ordinance we're talking about tonight, too, Mr. Only Zeller, M-Rock. only applies to the MROC district. I agree. Right. Which, but, but there could be a substantial rehab of an office, an existing office building. You see that going on all, all right now in the MROC district along Congress Avenue. So I think for that particular, they would only. Um need to try to take advantage of this program if they were planning on adding units. So if they were rehabbing and they fell within the density, then this wouldn't apply at all. But if they were asking to go up to the max revitalization incentive density, then they would have to go through the process of getting those units, uh, get it having um, restrictive covenants recorded on that. But it would only apply, again, if they go over that on their particular proposed development. Okay, I just want to make sure that the affordable housing is captured if there is even a redevelopment going on as opposed to yeah, any new projects mixed that would, use development. Yeah, any new projects that would come in that would be requesting to go up to that density would have to do the affordable housing. Even if, if it was you, a if you don't, Yeah, if you don't do affordable housing, you don't get 50. Okay. A question? I just want to make sure that uh, this is specifically limited, this uh, approval or denial to making sure our regulations accord with the state regulations regarding this issue. These additional uh, uh, recommendations are not included is that correct in what we're... That's correct. We were... For further Because study. we had to open up the section anyway to amend it, we thought it would be a good time to look at that. The other um, issue that I also wanted to bring up related to the 30% is if we start um, changing the percentages for the other categories, or for all of them, to make it 30 instead of the 20%, we would want to do some study staff internally to make sure that um, it was a rational nexus between the... The requirement and the, or the max to get to the requirement and then the base density because if you calculate the percentages of 30 what you would have to have is your minimum density it, it could um your minimum density lot. would have to be lower yes so we would want to research that to see how the numbers work before we or, and we would include that in the discussion to commission regarding your recommendations other well. places thank you other places where i've done business um do I hate to say this, but artificially lower the density to a point that's below what anybody would build yeah. and say, if you wish to build at that level, you don't have to provide any workforce housing. But if you wish to build at level A, you got to provide X percent level B. Yeah. And they have a table just like that. Um, but I'd like us to move along. So if I could get a motion. Yes. Ms. Blankenship. Um, okay. uh, recommend approval to the City Commission of Ordinance Number 20-22, amended to include an equal distribution of income limits, as well as a look by uh, the city staff to a possibility of 30% workforce housing um, to be reported back to City Commission as part of the report. 
uh, city initiated amendment to the land development regulations amending section 4.4.29 mixed office residential and commercial MROC district to bring the regulations into compliance with HB 7103 to make corrective updates and to revise the language to improve readability by finding that the amendment as amended and approval thereof is consistent with a comprehensive plan and meets the criteria set forth in land development regulations. Second for discussion. Ms. Morrison. Um, you said equal distribution of income limits. Could we add, um, if feasible, because we don't know if that's um, going to be feasible. We, we don't have enough data. This was, this was the affordable housing group's recommendation, and we haven't had a chance to study it. Well, or we do have other um, districts. In districts in the city where we have it currently. So I would say that we are just following suit for those other Districts that we have, Ms. Issa, what's, um, oh, sorry, Ms. Rebecca Dossier. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Ms. Dossier. So I think staff felt comfortable with the mix of income groups. It was the, the percentage of the 30% mm -hmm. as opposed to 20 that we needed to put a little more thought into to make sure it was considered permissible. You're no longer talking about one in every five units. You're talking about three in 10, 50% mm -hmm. increase. Mm -hmm. A question? For discussion, sure, Mr. Weinberg, please. <laughs> I don't want to further the discussion any longer than it needs to be, but I was a little confused. Where were you reading from? From the staff report? It's uh, in the staff report. Options for board action. These are uh, requests to provide a recommendation to the City Commission on this particular audience uh, ordinance, which is limited to bring the regulations into compliance with HB 7103 to make corrective updates and to revise the language to improve readability. Is that what we're voting on? Yes, but I think you yes, uh, chose option what B. What am I missing? Mr. It. Bennett, yes. Mr. Bennett also suggested language that Ms. Blankenship should include after hearing our comments, That's which is I why think. she made the motion in the way she did after Mr. Bennett, excuse me, instructed her. Scroll to the end. Okay. The, we just the, read it one more I time. I couldn't see it. Maybe. Like me to read it? Or, or at least the first part of it again. Are we done with the discussion then? Okay. Are we done with the discussion? What was just a, a real summary of what was asked? Yeah, what we're voting on would be nice. What we're voting Nothing on. Nothing of it is up there. Um, Specifically. <clears throat> okay. I Listen will, to her motion okay, again. <laughs> I will do it again. Uh, recommend approval to the City Commission of Ordinance Number 20 22, amended to include the equal distribution of income limits across the development as well as a look by the city staff to a potential 30 percent workforce housing uh, um, and they will bring that to the city commission um, and as part of the staff report uh, a city initiated amendment to the land development regulations amending section 4.4.29 mixed office residential and commercial MROC district to bring the regulations into compliance with HB 7103 to make corrective updates and to revise the language to improve readability by finding that the amendment as, amend, as amended and approval thereof is consistent with the comprehensive plan and meets the criteria set forth in land development regulations. Can I just one clarification? Yes. The distributions between very low, low, and moderate? Yes, that's correct. correct. Motion, do I have a second? I'll second Again, for yes. discussion, I'm sorry. Ex the Excuse me. I'm sorry. Biz Howell oh. <laughs> made the motion, <laughs> seconded the motion. I'm sorry. Chair, I just want to uh, also, yeah. for the record, uh, yeah. just catch that uh, Mr. Long did arrive at 543. Yes, I was going to do that once we got past this item. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. Ms. Miller, could you please call the roll? Mr. Long going to be? Uh, Mr. Well, excuse me, Mr. Session. Bennett, he wasn't here for the discussion, so he is not going it, It's a legislative item, so it's not quasi-judicial. It's not based upon so evidence of the record. Um, you know, Mr. Long was to confirm that he's read the backup and, and listened to the, the discussion that's been had about the amendments. You know, he's free to, to vote. In fact, I would say he's obligated to vote unless he has a conflict. Fine. I've read, the, I've read the staff report, so I feel comfortable about it. Thank you, Mr. Long. Let the record show, Mr. Long, I don't know if his microphone was on, read the staff report and feels comfortable voting on the item. Ms. Rob Mo Long. <laughs> You're first, right. huh? Yeah. <laughs> yes. 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 Thank you. Michael, yeah. Joy Howell. Yes. Alan Zeller. Yes. Christina Morrison. No. Max Weinberg. No. 
Julian Blankenship? Yes. Chris Davey? Yes. Let the record show the item passed five to two. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dossery. Mr. Allen. <clears throat> Chair, while uh, staff is getting a presentation ready, uh, this was item originally 8E. Yes, sir. We had a request from uh, the subject property's owner to postpone to the next meeting. So we're actually, we will need to open the item. So we'll do ex parte, we'll allow public comment, and then the board can make a, a motion to continue to a date certain, which would be the June meeting, which we'll get. Fine. All right, so good afternoon. This is Andrew Allen, planner, reading into the record file number 2022 162 for 214 Northeast 22nd Lane, a rezoning in the corresponding ordinance of 19 22. So for the subject property, it's a 0 0.6 acres located at 214 Northeast 22nd Lane. It's east of the intersection of Seacrest Boulevard and Northeast 22nd Lane. Currently, the property is a single family home. The request is to amend the zoning map designation from neighborhood commercial to single family residential, uh, specifically R1AA. The chair, I actually think if we're just, yes. unless there's an oh. objection to postponing, I think we can just move straight to right ex parte public That's comment and do the motion. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, can I ask my colleagues any ex parte communication on this item? No. 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 I visited the site. Morrison. I visited the site and researched it through the property appraiser's website and through the corporate records of the state of Florida. Perfect. I have none. Is there any public comment? Is there anyone here this evening wishing to speak on this item on the agenda, which would be 8E as an echo? <coughs> Seeing none, public comment is closed. The applicant on this item has asked that it be postponed and not heard. So if I could have a motion to postpone this to a date certain, Ms. Miller, could you give me the exact date of our June meeting? I forget what it is. Mm. And I wanna be correct. 21st. Please, so if I could get a motion to postpone item 8E to June um, 21st. I'll make a motion to postpone item 8E until June 21st. Date certain. Date certain. Second. Second. Hold on, uh, Ms. Alvarez is standing up. Let's just make sure before we do that. <laughs> I thought it was the 14th. I, no, I think it's June 20th. Um, yeah, the, first, the third Monday of June is June 20th. Mm. June 20th. Yes. That's correct. If you could amend I'll amend your motion. my motion to say uh, to a date certain June 20th. I amend my second. Yes, Ms. Morrison, second. And if you could please call the roll, Ms. Miller. Rob Long? Yes. Ray Howell? Yes. Helen Zeller? Yes. Christina Morrison? Yes. Max Weinberg? Yes. Julian Blankenship? Yes. Chris Davey? Yes. Let the um, record show that item passed 7 to 0. Um, and also, I forgot to state it, Mr. Bennett noted that Mr. Long joined us at 543. Thank you. Apologies to the board for my tardiness. I had unexpected delay. Things happen. <laughs> Don't even... um, Mr. Allen, yeah. 8F. <laughs> if right. you can be as quick as 8A, you can be great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so reading into the Andrew Allen, reading into the record, file number 2022 124, uh, previously advertised at agenda item 8F. Uh, for Northeast 14th Street, a corrective land use map amendment and the corresponding ordinance of 16-22. So the subject property is a 0 0.5 acres. Uh, it's located at the east of the intersection of Northeast 3rd Ave and Northeast 14th Street, which you see highlighted in the map here on the slide. The existing development, there is none, is just currently open space. Uh, and our request is to amend the land use map designation from low density residential to open space. Perfect. 
So for site history, the subject parcel has had an open space land use designation since 1989. Uh, fast forward to 2017, the, when the city was transitioning from using AutoCAD to GIS mapping software, the designation of the parcel was inadvertently changed from LD to open space or OS. Uh, 2017, staff discovered the uh, Scrivener's error, and ac uh, according to the Department of Economic Opportunity, uh, we had to move forward with an official amendment to the land use map. So what you see here on the left is the adopted land use map in 2016 using the old software. Highlighted in red, you see the clearly designated open space or OS area. What you see on the right is the adopted land use map after the change to GIS where the open space area was removed and it was basically designated as a LD or a low density residential. So here we have on the left, we have the existing land use map from 2021 where the property is still designated as LD. And on the right, we have the proposed land use map where it's changed to open space. Uh, right now on the screen we have the required findings from LDR section 3.11 in terms of land use map and zoning consistency. The proposed amendment reverts the open space land use designation, reverts to the open space land use designation that was initially adopted by the city in 1989, which would bring the property's land use and zoning into consistency. In terms of concurrency, the request is not currently associated with any development proposals. Any future development requests must provide adequate level of service. Uh, the plan did not intend for the LD land use designation to be applied to the current area, and the land use designation is the, in the proposed amendment was previously determined to be compatible with the surrounding area. In terms of public notices, a mailer was sent to all owners of all properties with a 500-foot radius 10 days prior to this meeting, and public notice signs were also posted on the property seven days prior to the meeting. And on the screen, we have our options for board action. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Let me ask my colleagues, um, was there any ex parte communication on this item? No. 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 Let the record show there was I, none. I visited the site. I visit, go drive by that site very often. I'm familiar with it. There's a lot of mature, beautiful trees that screen the railroad back there. I had none familiar either. Familiar with it. Beautiful. Same for me. So um, let me state. Is there anybody here who wish to speak on this item? Now is the time to step forward and speak because it's public comment. The item agenda item is 8F. Seeing nobody stepping forward, I will close public comment and ask my colleagues do they have any questions or are we ready for a motion? Oh, it's a retention basin, so I'll go ahead and make a motion if that's okay. That would be great, Ms. Morrison. A motion to approve. Let me get to the right page. Motion to uh, recommend approval to the City Commission of Ordinance 16-22, a city-initiated land use map amendment for the property located to the east of the intersection of Northeast 3rd Avenue and Northeast 14th Street, from low-density residential LD to open space OS, to correct the data conversion error by finding that the amendment and approval thereof is consistent with the comprehensive plan and meets the criteria set forth in land development regulations. Second. Second. Second by Ms. Howell. Ms. Miller, if you could please call the roll. <clears throat> Rob Long. Yes. Joy Howell. Yes. Alan Zeller. Yes. Christina Morrison. Yes. Max Weinberg. Yes. Dylan Blankenship. Yes. Chris Davey. Yes. Let the record show the item passed 7 to 0. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Thank you. <laughs> and with that, Mr. Rusher. Give me one second. Mr. Take Chair. your time. Let me ask, we're going into item number 8A. Um, was there any ex parte communication? No. No. I researched the site as usual. No. <clears throat> Seller? No? Sorry? Any ex parte communication on 8A? On this Davis Road thing? Yes. Other than visiting that obscure site, there was no... <laughs> Let the record show, um, Mr. Rusher forwarded a file folder with uh, correspondence from the neighbors, videos, and photographs, and I reviewed that this afternoon. All those items are on the city server. Correct. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Brian Rusher, Transportation Planner with the City of Delray Beach. Good evening, everybody. I'd like to enter file number 2021-128 into the record. Mr. Schumacher is here representing himself, and let me just get his presentation pulled up. 
and put on full screen for you all. Uh, Mr. Schumacher, the floor is yours. Hello, uh, my name is Ch uh, Chad Schumacher. I'm here with my wife, May Schumacher, and my daughter, Livy Schumacher. And it's May's birthday today. I'm not going to tell you how old. <laughs> um, and Libby just got accepted to Plumosa School of the Arts. So we're very, very uh, proud about that. And congratulations. And tonight, so it's a full night. <laughs> um, I, I just want to um, kind of introduce ourselves. Uh, we have an abandoned, we have a, uh, a piece of property right next to our property. And a lot of you have visited it. And it's, uh, it's a connection to our property. And we maintained the property since we bought the house in 2018. Um, my wife and I wanted to live there since, uh, since we were married in 1999. So we, have, we had a deep um, uh, wanting to be in the community. Uh, the prospective abandonment would add another layer of security to our neighborhood because uh, we're the first house when you, co when you come around the corner and we don't have a gate since we're not in HOA. And ourselves and our cross street neighbor, uh, Cameron, uh, everybody looks out for the community, but we are the first line uh, of defense for the community. And I think this, uh, this abandonment allotment would allow us to secure the land more, um, a lot more better. The, um, uh, my daughter, uh, she's 11 years old. She refuses to go outside by herself because she is of the um, scared of the traffic going by there. There's a lot of uh, traffic going to other um, other the neighbors and uh, lawn care and pool care, and we just want to prevent the constant traffic going by there. Okay. Want to do the first? Yeah, I can. I can transition the slides for you if you'd like. Okay, the request is to abandon a portion of Lake Worth uh, District right away. Uh, there's 17,059 square feet in the total area, so it's roughly a half of an acre. Um, we're gonna use it as, as an extension of our fam a single family homes yard. And the applicant and past owners, applicant being me, and past owners have maintained this area at their expense over the years. We, ha we did landscaping. We just put $8,000 of irrigation, um, not in that particular area, but throughout our home. And we take care of it. We have trees, we have a mature uh, tamarind tree, and we have planted many frangipanis. Um, so the city engineer does support the abandonment and Lake Worth Drainage District also supports abandonment. Uh, we have approval from all of the utilities um, and it was tough going after. We've been going uh, through this for about two years, so it was very, very difficult to get. And there's no utility, utility lines either. Uh, there's a fences at the east and west borders of the subject property that prevent public access and say no trespassing because of Lake Worth Drainage District. And there's also um, um, an easement off the canal. So if a neighbor needs to have their um, to work done on the back of their house and they need to get back there, they'll have 48 hours uh, to, sorry, to call the Lake Worth Drainage District and have the gates open on both sides of the east and west of the property. So, and every neighbor on the water, on the canal, has access to the back. So, let's go. Next one. that's the west Lake Worth Drainage District gate. Uh, currently, there's construction going on there. Uh, Banyan, I think it's Banyan Creek Manors or something like that. Um, not sure. But this is the West Lake, Lake Worth Drainage District gate. And policy 2.4.6 M5, there is not, nor will there be, a need for the use of the right of way for any public purposes. Uh, the abandonment does not, nor will not, prevent access to a lot of record. The abandonment will not result in a detriment to the provision of access and or utility services to adjacent properties or the general area. Uh, like I said before, the city engineer does support the abandonment and Lake Worth Drainage District also supports a full abandonment of the property. This is the north side. Um, we're facing north at this point, going into the property. 
and then the south area. Now, in conclusion, please vote to approve the abandonment. Uh, we meet all of the required findings, uh, planning and zoning supports, uh, the engineer, I apologize, a city engineer supports abandonment, and there is no future need or use of the property. Let's see, we maintain uh, the landscaping and irrigation are at our expense for the four years that we owned it, and the previous owner as well. Uh, like I say, the 48 hours notice is required for Lake Worth Drainage District approval to access the right of way. Any questions? No, Mr. sir, not at the... No, Mr. Debbie, may, if I may uh, sure. amend my ex parte communications. I did get an Please. email on the city server. Did? Yes. No problem. <laughs> uh, Mr. Shoemaker, yes. um, you made your presentation. Now we're just going to turn it over uh, to city staff and let Mr. Richard speak. Thank you. Once again, Brian Richard, Transportation Planner. The City of Delray Beach, file number 2021-128 is this uh, request to abandon the portion of Davis Road at the term northern terminus of the street. The resolution number is 5922. Um, I'd like to thank Mr. Shoemaker for uh, making his presentation. I'm going yes. to go into some elements of the abandonment request, uh, make some clarifications to, you know, just the file, just make sure that everything, everyone's aware and on the same page, and then as uh, Chairman Davey uh, indicated, we did receive a number of comments um, via emails, pictures, uh, and otherwise letters sent, which were forwarded to the board for your consideration. So I would, uh, encourage you to just briefly look through those if you have not already. So um, as discussed before. Excuse uh, me. If I could ask you if you could please speak closer to the mic. <laughs> I think some members of the board are having a difficulty <clears throat> hearing you. I'll do what I can. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it doesn't get taller. Um, so as I mentioned before, the abandonment area is the northern portion of the, uh, Davis Road. So this is the subject area in blue here located on the screen. It is the terminus of the public road right of way for Davis Road. Lone Pine Road is a privately owned and maintained road which ex extends westward from Davis Road. Uh, Mr. Shoemaker's uh, residence, he's the applicant. His site is located immediately adjacent to the property. So this, this generally just goes over, you know, the area's use is, is largely rural residential on Lone Pine. It's almost exclusively zoned R1AA or PRD in the surrounding area. Other than that, it is rural residential for Lone Pine Road itself. The request, of course, as the applicant covered, is to provide a recommendation to the City Commission for this board on the abandonment of this about 17,000 square foot area of unimproved street right of way. Currently, there are no utilities, no um, public improvements located on that property. How the dedications were made are important. So in 1959, about June 30th through July 3rd, there were a number of uh, records filed for the Palm Beach County Public Records. Um, this uh, right of way was dedicated by a right of, right of way deed to the county. And then subsequently, these right of ways were then annexed into the city of Delray Beach. And the reason that is important is because we have to look, go back and look at the right-of-way deeds to see what the purpose of the dedication was provided for. So a right-of-way easement and uh, right-of-way and easement in and to said lands for public highway purposes was the original purpose of these deeds, strictly for right-of-way for a highway. The applicable rule in this instance is 246M. Basically, it states that any public right-of-way may be abandoned and it's returned to the fee simple property owners. More frequently, this board sees abandonments that have to deal with plats. In those cases, they're dedicated and uh, the dedications are returned and split equally to the property owner. So in this instance, it's important to understand that you're looking at right-of-way deeds, in which case it's returned to the adjacent property owner entirely. So you are looking at some aerial photography and uh, from north and south facing views. So the image on the left shows North, you know, you can see the obvious, you know, dead end of Davis Road into Lone Pine Road. And on the uh, right side of the screen, you see the uh, requested abandonment area approximately depicted on the screen uh, in the box uh, on red. 
another perspective of that is an uh, image similar to what the applicant showed is this is just a Google Street View image of the property. The findings required to be made for an abandonment are located on the screen and they're pulled from uh, LDR246M5. Uh, I wanted to draw your attention to a few, few of them and then of course the recommendation of the city engineer and also of the Lake Worth Drainage District. So A through C are covered on the screen. A is probably the one of the most important it's for board deliberation. Um, that there is not, nor will there be, a need for the use of the right-of-way for any public purpose. Um, we'll get into that in, two, in a minute. Um, B, obviously, is discussed also, and that will, will not prevent access to a lot of record. Um, and I'm shortening these for expediency's sake. Um, and then C, of course, it will not prevent, in, uh, will not result in detriment and provision of access to utility services to adjacent properties or the general area. So, of course, uh, utility services, as discussed before, are not located within the requested abandonment area. Um, of course, I would like to cover the abandonment uh, request with respect to the city engineer who did provide a recommendation of approval based on the comprehensive plan policies that he was given. Um, for the, just for the record, the Lake Worth Drainage District did provide a letter of non-objection. Um, for clarity's sake, that just means as um, First, that they do not object to the right-of-way being abandoned with a contingency that they are at least granted 40 feet of access along any abandoned right-of-way so that they can maintain the lateral 30 canal. So they want to make sure that they can still access and reserve an interest in at least 40 feet of the abandoned area by means of an easement or other um, dedication to them if this abandonment is approved. And that's reflected in the resolution as well. Additionally, we look at the comprehensive plan, uh, LDRs. Um, as part of this, we discussed the LDRs on the previous slide. So the comprehensive plan, there are two specific policies. MBL 277, for the most part, matches um, the language that is found within the LDRs for consistency stake. Um, policy NDC 221 um, largely has to deal with maintaining and enhancing our street grid and our street network. We want to provide that as much as feasible. In this instance, you know, the, the street grid does not necessarily apply. It is a dead end street on the, on the opposite side of the canal. There's an image, which I can show you a little bit later, is Boynton Beach. Boynton Beach has developed a golf course and residential on the opposite side. So therefore, this will not become a street ac access network um, in particular and per se. So. They might not necessarily apply as much. Full coverage of this is provided in the staff report. As discussed before, um, the Davis Road abandonment, this is give or take, uh, this is a survey of the property, what you're looking at, Exhibit A and the, the resolution as well. Um, what I want to show you here is the outlined requested abandonment area. And then in blue, again, is the requested 40 feet of Lake Worth Drainage District access easement, which has been requested in their letter of non-objection. So as I'd stated before, um, and as the chair noted, the, um, the we are required to send out mailers with all abandonment requests. We are required to mail to immediately adjacent property owners, provide mailers to 500 feet uh, residents, uh, any courtesy notices, in which case we provided a courtesy notice to Rainberry Villas HOA. Uh, we have posted this on the website and also um, placed this in the newspaper. And we've received um, a number of in inquiries, and I've kind of generalized them into those on the screen. Obviously, general inquiries from residents within 500 feet. Hey, what does this mean for me? Do I have to take anything on? Um, but we've also received comments to the effect that there is public recreation, which is currently accessed on the canal. Lake Worth Drainage District currently allows what they have called passive recreation on their lateral 30, which means you know, walking, fishing, um, walking your boat, not driving your boat <laughs> out to the, out to the, the like the, riding that uh, they hmm, yeah. <laughs> give or take. Yeah. Um, I, but I'll let, let that, them that definition, but it's simple recreational activities. Um, so people have discussed how if there are, if this abandonment is approved, it might affect their ability to use that canal for public recreational purposes, mm -hmm. similarly for maintenance activities of their properties. Um, Lake Worth Drainage District did request that, just to put into the record, that any vehicles that are going onto the canal 
now or <laughs> into the future should be getting a permit. As I said before, they want passive recreation, any maintenance activities, they would like to have a permit just so they know and they can go and inspect the canal, make sure no damage was done to that. And they wanted to make sure that that was reflected. Uh, we did receive comments about the fairness of an abandonment should the city be giving away however many square feet to a property owner. Um, obviously, there have been <laughs> objections outright and then objections to abandoning the right of way without providing any other form of public access. And then um, some in the form of support where you know people would like to see access controlled a little bit better on this um, abandonment area. And they don't think that the city has done a very good job of maintaining that area on its own. So that is just a quick summary. Um, this is just an aerial of Lone Pine Road to give you all a point of reference. There are about you know, 20 plus residences um, on Lone Pine Road. It's a privately maintained road. Um, to give you an idea of some of the things that we heard is that people use Davis Road, um, both members of Lone Pine Road and members of the public to access the L30 Canal. Um, so you have maybe people that are in this community seeing people who do not live in the immediate area parking along Davis Road to access or residents simply using it to let their kids walk and you know enjoy the, the L30 Canal. So that is just a quick summary of the points that we've heard since those mailers have gone out. We wanted to share with the board and try to give you all as much information as we could. Um, obviously the recommendation um, of the commission will be forwarded to city commission. So we have before you the options to move a recommendation approval, move a recommendation of approval as uh, modified as the board sees fit. That um, amendment, should you choose to go through with it, would also go back to Lake Worth Drainage District to make sure that they do not object um, for the board, to what the board is asking, or a recommendation of denial, um, which is also available to you. Um, with that being said, these, that's all the uh, points I'd like to make. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to have them. Okay. I'm going to welcome up Mr. Sh uh, Shoemaker. Shoemaker, yep. To the opposite side if you have any questions for him as well. <laughs> sure. Well, as we get into, I'm going to open it up to public comment in a minute. And uh, then after that, we'll turn it over to the board and see uh, what questions my colleagues have, OK? Thank you, Mr. Usher. Thank you. Um, so uh, I would ask at this time, is there any member of the public wishing to come forth and speak on this item? Now would be the time to come forward and speak on uh, this item, if you wish to, as a member of the public. I'd ask you, sir, to please step to the podium that Mr. Shoemaker was at. Thank you. And if you could please state your name and address for the record, sir. Uh, my name is James Hylinski. Um, I live right next door. Um, Lone Pine Road resident for 30 years. As most of the people on Lone Pine Road have been there a long, long time. Uh, one other thing I'd like to point out, as well as the recreation aspect of people enjoying that, um, there's a, an emergency um, factor to this as well. Um, our road does not have uh, city water or sewer. We have no um, fire hydrants. And the canal, should there be a fire, is going to be one of the access points for the emergency vehicles, possibly fire trucks, to access water out of that. Um, obviously, we want to be able to make sure those fire trucks can get in and out as quickly as possible. Another time, just this past year, um, we've had a, um, a SWAT truck come down that canal and actually apprehend a suspect down there that was armed. Um, so that happened. They got the suspect, pulled him in, and another thing, quick access. We need to get in there. We can't wait 48 hours for somebody to open a gate, as well as losing all our recreational privileges. Um, I think that's, you know, that you has everything else, that all my neighbors, you know, just want things to remain the same. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Appreciate it. Is there any other member of the public who wishes to come forward and speak on this item? Now would be the time to do so. Seeing no one coming forward, public comment would be closed. Uh, I would now turn to my colleagues on the board, and excuse me before I do. Chair. Yes. Uh, rebuttal and cross examination. Rebuttal, that's what I was just going to step into. Uh, Mr. Rusher, Mr. Shoemaker, do you have any cross examination or rebuttal for each other? 
I have no cross-examination or rebuttal. Me neither. Perfect. Let the record show both parties declined. And I will now turn it over to my colleagues um, for who has questions and or comments uh, for the applicant or staff. Who'd like to go first? I can go first if you want. Ms. Morrison, perfect. Um, Thank you. Brian, is there any other access for the public to access the canal except from this area along Lone Pine? To this canal in particular, I believe that um, Mr. Shoemaker's presentation showed the access gates to the east and the west. Those are typically locked by Lake Worth Drainage District, so this would be one of the only points of access to the canal. Okay, so if this is abandoned... The, well, I will just say with the exception, the property owners to the north of the canal do have their access to the, the, right. to the canal I mean, itself. On, yes, right, on the south side. So um, there would be no access to the canal if this uh, site were abandoned and given to Mr. Schumacher. Is that the case? The, there would be access for the Lake Worth Drainage District to um, have for their maintenance purposes. They have not indicated if they would be wanting to fence this property or not, but the easement that is reflected in the resolution is restricted to the Lake Worth Drainage District for their maintenance activities. Okay. Is there any compensation for being given for the abandonment? Compensation is not offered for abandonments of right of way. Right. And that's and that's not required by land development regulations, so it's Food. basically it's irrelevant. Um, so I'd try advise the board to steer away from sure. that. Okay, I withdraw that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Morrison. Anybody else? Yeah, I have a question. Mr. Weinberg. The title is vested in the Lake Worth Drainage District. No, so let me pull up the uh, survey one more time. So it will remain so. Uh, so the way that this would work is the... Could you speak into the mic, please? Sorry. Thank you. The area on the screen in red depicts the requested abandonment area. So if the board were to pass the resolution as it's currently written, it would reserve in the interest of the public an easement for the Lake Worth Drainage District. However, all of the property would be retained by the shoemakers. So the shoemakers would then hold title to all of this land. They would be encumbered with an easement to the Lake Worth Drainage District on the eastern 40 most feet here so that they may maintain the prop, their L30 canal. It's about 80 feet wide. It is 80 feet wide currently. I think it's 213 feet. Deep. With, deep, yes. Uh, the reference was made to a fence. Where are the fences? Are there fences along the property line? Currently, I do not. Uh, on the eastern and western access points to the canal, Lake Worth Drainage District. The eastern and western. That would on, excuse me, uh, Mr. Weinberg, I'll just jump in here and make it easier. On uh, Barwick Road and on Congress Avenue, there are gates to access the canal for the Lake Worth Drainage Districts, where the canal would hit Congress Avenue. If you wanted to access that canal, if this is abandoned, that's where you would go. You would call the Lake Worth Drainage District, and they would unlock the gates on Congress Avenue or on Barwick Road. Correct, Mr. Shoemaker? Correct. Correct. And okay. if, if I may, I believe there is some fence to the east of this. That was what I was referring to. Rain reference rain made to an existing fence. Where is that? I believe that's is that a gated different. fence. It's the, the the right of way itself currently is not fenced. There is an existing fence on the eastern boundary that is for Rainberry Villas, but that is not <coughs> the public right of way. Where, Rainberry where Lakes. Lakes. Yep. Rainberry Lakes is the property. There is a right. Of, there's a tract that they have um, here. There's like a long hedge that goes just along. They're the, the property road. owner to the east. Correct. All those houses along the east side, on the right side of that photo, if you look at the houses that are with the black lines between them, thank you. Those were all houses, and that's Rainberry Lakes, if I'm not mistaken. That <laughs> is a large hand, landscape, landscape hedge along the yes. roadway on the eastern portion. And there's a fence behind the houses in Rainberry Lakes. What's the uh, practical, uh, just generally, the practical... Um, of abandoning this, what would be the practical use and how would it change the use, the present usage? So I will let the 
um, applicant also provide a response after I get through. So just really quickly, um, one, the city holds title. First and foremost, it controls the right of way itself. So currently this is restricted to the city of Delray Beach's use functionality to see as it deems fit within reason that you know it matches up with the deed restrictions for right of way purposes mm -hmm. if it's abandoned it um for, for two reasons two things would happen first um, those development entitlements would go to the property owner so they would be able to maybe expand their home and their footprint a little bit larger that's one thing that could happen it would they would allow a little bit more density units per acre you know thing like that but it's a very modest increase so it wouldn't ultimately improve it that much. The second thing is that it reserves basically the rights and privileges of the property to the shoemakers. So they would be able to control the access as they deem fit um, to the rear of their property from the portion that is abandoned. Say that again? The Into the microphone, please. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, years of being told to stand up straight going out the window. <laughs> we need a bigger microphone stand is what we need. So just shortly the first reason is that the the two practical results from this firstly is that the development entitlements go back to the property owners they would be able to use the land for density intensity lot coverage etc mm -hmm. the second is that the abandonment with whatever uh, easement encumbrances would be returned to the shoemakers for their purposes so if they wanted to put a fence on the property to control access better they would be able to do that um, I've spoken to the effects on the adjacent property owners and to the community as a whole with respect to the public use of the canal. I think you've gotten a pretty good summary of that. You know, you know that there are people walking, there are people fishing, there's man's landscaping and security concerns which have been raised for the board consideration, but those are the two practical impacts of abandoning the right of way. Is there a fence now there on the uh, property line? No. Um, I do not believe it. It's just open space. There is a fence. It's over in the bushes. It's pushed away. Somebody, somebody pulled it away. So it's located um, right here. Right there. Yes. Right where you saw the opening. It's 40 feet to Lake Virginia fence with a no trespassing sign. Yeah. And then there's can it used to be there. If if any, excuse me, excuse so, me. We so, can allow comments. <laughs> so fuck, there is isn't a, a fence. I believe I saw some images which dictate that there's some fencing in the hedges here. Ultimately, access isn't controlled by that fence. It's just that there's a posted no trespassing sign. No, I'm referring to the uh, looking at the screen, the right side red line. Is there a fence there? Is that the property line? This right here? Yeah. There's no fence there. There's no fence. No. And the sort of circular road, that's the old, I guess that existed before the house was there no, that's part of the driveway it's his driveway the house that's his driveway, driveway. that's a driveway to the house right it's a public circular this, driveway to the house. what is the uh if you go to the right that structure the t that's mr shoemaker's house no oh, not that yes. <laughs> obviously well, that's looks that like house. a former roundabout in the front of the house it's the former or is it i don't know but that's what i'm trying to help yes it needs to be redone i know i'm sorry it's a what it needs to be redone yes it was a former round it leads to the street Yes. Yes, that's connected to uh, Lone Pine. Mm. Would be. Interesting. Horseshoe. Uh, mm. I, I have a question. When Mr. And, Heinberg's done. Uh, Lone Pine is a private street? Yes, it Lone is. Lone Pine Road is private, yes. It's not gated. Correct. Nope. No. no. Can you define that for me? I'm, I'm a little like confused. A gated community? Uh, what does that well, mean? This is a privately held subdivision similar to like. As soon as you make away. that turn, off of the end of Davis Road. Right. And you go on to Davis Road is the city street. Okay? But as soon as you make that left turn, that 90 degree corner there, it's private. You're on Lone Pine Road. And that's a and privately owned road. So right. in other words, if that so road needs to be repaved, they do not look to the city of Delray Beach. No. They look to each homeowner. Which it does need to be. I'm just yes, saying. It does. So what happens is there the road was not built to the width uh, characteristics or any other characteristics or drainage characteristics to the degree that the city of Delray Beach would want a road improved. That's also why there are fire hydrants, as the neighbor spoke earlier, 
along Davis Road, but I oftentimes do mountain bike up Lone, Lone Pine Road or ride my bike, there are no fire hydrants on that road because it, it is a private road and the city did not install hydrants on it. Mr. Rauscher, would that uh, explanation be in accord with the explanation you were about to give me? Yes, <laughs> thank okay. you. It, in that community, I'll just say the road center line is where the property boundaries lay. So Could the property owners on Lone Pine gate that off if they wanted? They'd have to get every property owner on the street and potentially the city to agree to there's, that change. There's currently an access easement. Mr. Rauscher, is that the way you would answer that question? Yes. It's a little circuitous. Yeah. The and I think we'll answer the question wanted, for you. But I might speak that, louder than him. <laughs> yeah, would your, would your answer comport with that? Yes, and I, I think Mr. Bennett wanted to make this go full circle. So. Well, and, and I was, was going to try to help a little bit. So some of your questions are about future potential things. Um, Brian, if, do you have the slide with the findings under 246M? I do. So I kind of want to help funnel you guys back into to what we're looking at. So, so really, you're looking at three findings. That's it. And so... The first one is obviously about the, the need for a public purpose. So that's where the discussion and questions are about whether fishing, canal access, maybe even whether a fire truck let would me, need the canal access. Let me, yeah, I, Mr. Yeah. Bennett, I understand what you're saying. Let me just start off by saying, having looked at this site many times, I ride through this neighborhood, I read a number of letters from the neighbors, it is obvious that this is being used by the community um, to access the Lake Worth Drainage District by neighbors and other people. Okay, it would be my opinion that, um, given the fact that there are no fire hydrants on Lone Pine Road, um, I don't know what the fire situation would be um, in the event that there was a catastrophic fire. But my thought would be. If the Lake Worth Drainage District is going to keep 40 feet, show, so should the city of Delray Beach. Because as much as our city engineer is saying that um, there's no future use for this, um, I see that it's being used now. And I'd also want our fire department to weigh in on the fact that, what, you know, would they potentially use this to put a truck down there and drop a hose into the Lake Worth Drainage District Canal in the event that they had to extinguish a very large fire? Um, you know, I think that these are questions that were not being uh, given the data to answer tonight. And I think that um, I, I would really, it would be impossible for me after reading the letters from the neighbors and everything to reach a finding that there is no public use for this um, going forward. I agree with you, Mr. Chair. I was gonna make the same point that obviously given what the, we've seen from the community responses, there there's a lot of public use of this land. And, and potentially a public safety use. And potentially it. a public safety use. So therefore, I don't believe it meets the, the three criteria that we've been tasked with analyzing it against tonight. And I will not be in favor of it. I agree. I believe that there is a definitely a public um, use and a public purpose to that land. Um, Light, light recreation is already permitted by the Lake Worth Drainage District, and I'm not in favor of taking away um, anyone's right to uh, their enjoyment that they've been access public property. So I would not be in favor of it. I, I, would it be okay if I finished my questioning of? Please, Mr. Weinberg, I am Mr. sorry. I, I apologize. I'm Thank sorry. you. I, you right, I just have a couple more. Please. Uh, in the event that this is abandoned. Um, would that prevent any emergency? In other words, if you take, they have a perpetual 40 foot by 200 something foot easement to access, you're basically cutting the property. If, in, a, in, a, in a, theoretically, you're cutting the property in half. The entirety of the property is being deeded to the applicant, uh, potentially. But half of it always maintains the perpetual easement for access to the canal? That would be correct for the Lake Worth Drainage District. I will add, 
I've checked with our police and our fire. Um, typically, in the instance that they do need to fight something or you know provide emergency services to the canal, they if it were gated, for example, and they needed to get to the property, they have a very hefty, very nice tool called a four foot long bolt cutter, where they will <laughs> utilize that on any fence, padlock, etc., to access the canal from the rear if, if that situation were to arise. Um, so that being said, they they do they would be given access in that means to to fight an emergency in that instance. Police have police and and fire have a very broad you know right set of you know, the public still have access to. I'm they, not familiar with the area, but is it used recreationally at the I, moment? I there have been public comments which reflect the public use of the property to date by residents in the area, and then also residents outside of the area using it to park on Davis Road and then go and use the canal um, for fishing, walking, et cetera. Walking along That's the canal and fishing. Correct. I see. Mr. Rusher, did you send that email to the entire board that you sent earlier today with all of the comments? Yes. Okay. That's all the questions I have. I, I have a question. So there wouldn't be any prohibition, I take it, if, it w if the total 80 feet were abandoned? To be able to fence off the front of that, would there? There, there, they would be able to fence off the front. Um, the western 40 feet would be fenced off, and if the shoemakers decide to fence that area off, they would fence it. Um, they would have that option available to them. The eastern 40 feet, if the abandonment is approved as it's laid out by commission without a modification, the eastern 40 foot feet could be gated similar to the entrances at Barwick and at Congress with the padlock for Lake Worth Drainage District if they so choose to put that in place. Do you mind if I interject a question, Mr. Zeller? Go for it. Thank you. However, if the city were to retain their right of way for the 40 feet and grant an easement to the Lake Worth Drainage District, Mr. Rusher, would we have to allow them to put a fence on that? No, if it's a public access easement, a fence would not be allowed over it, but I'll let, you know, Mr. Shoemaker, I did make that question to him earlier and I'll let him provide okay. a response sure. to it. Yeah, I mean, why can't it be Lake Worth Drainage District and City of Delray uh, access to the property? That's that's because we currently have a right of way on the property. I understand that. Why would we release our right of way and go to an easement when we can just give well, up I, half of the right of way? I, I will say this, Please. the city could reserve the eastern 40 feet as a public access easement if the board so chooses and if, if that's an agreeable position. <laughs> reserve that easement to the city onto itself for the public purposes of public access. And that it's not um, to be? Public access, more than the Lake Worth Drainage District would likely request that we restrict it to pedestrian okay. access. They do not want vehicles okay. um, going back into their into the uh, property. Um, I'm, I'm more just concerned with access, not. Okay. Yeah. Pedestrians and fire department, police department, I, I mean, that wouldn't be a problem. I mean, as long as there's no vehicles going back there, that's, and that's fine I, by me because they have 48 hours. Well, I mean, in all reality, I, I, we, we can't preclude the Lake Worth Drainage District from driving a vehicle back. No, 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 no. That's it's certainly not, something we can't. General public is what I'm saying. Chair. Yes, sir. I think if the board was going to consider a partial abandonment, I think that's what it should be limited to. It's abandonment recommendation to abandon the 40 western feet of the right-of-way. Thank you. Now, the, the city has the right, whether the applicant is in agreement or not, to reserve something under a condition. So the board could recommend an abandonment of all 80 feet and reserving upon itself a 40-foot easement over the eastern half, just as Lake Worth Drainage District has requested. So those are, are two options the board could pursue if it's considering a partial abandonment. My recommendation would be to just abandon the 40 feet of right of way. That's and the that way I'm less, um, less headache. Issues, right. right. If, if we're abandoning 40 feet and we're retaining 40. Correct. Would that be still limited to pedestrians? Well, it would be a city right of way. That would be so a city be, right of way. Yeah. It would be up to the city. Okay. Okay. 
And yeah, you could rec- we have like we have certain hours? people that come by, you know, with their, their employees go back there and every day. So okay, yeah, and their vehicles. So I'm still having tr- trouble with the public interest here. How is it served by any abandonment? <sighs> because I think that um, we maintain the property. I mean. Well, right now you maintain the property, and that's great. Um, People you, have. You get the, you know, you have a driveway that goes on a substantial portion that's been of it. there, yes. Which is great. And so you have full use of it, it seems. And I'm just wondering if you've calculated what your additional taxes will be when you Ms. Uh, end up with this. I just yeah. try to stay, excuse me, Ms. Shoemaker, Ms. Howell, let's try to stay on the item at hand. Mr. Rusher, what I would just like to ask is I guess I'm looking at it and saying, I think that portion of it should definitely be retained for public access. If other members think that should be the whole, the entire tract, that's, uh, you know, I mean, I'm not gonna disagree with that train of thought, but what I'm going to say is that I'd be fine with re- retaining the same amount that the Lake Worth Drainage District has allowed and the 40 feet. Can you put the map back up of the? Yes. With the blue outline and the red there. If you could, thank you. Well, I'm I'm, actually the aerial shot, that's the, because I'm still curious, um, excuse me, Mr. Chair, if the, if we, Give him the 40 feet, and then there's the closest other, to his house. He can, is the driveway would still be located in that easement that would be the city and Lake Worth Drainage District? Well, so he would still. It would be our right of way. Okay. It would be our right of way. The but, eastern 40 but, feet. If, yeah. But right, that the driveway. Eastern 40 feet. In other words, from the fence behind uh, Rainberry Lakes Homes, mm-hmm. out 40 feet to the west 40 feet would be the right of way is what assuming, we're talking about here. Assuming that fence is on the property. Right, so I'm saying right. roughly, right. So right Not now, his driveway substantially encroaches into the right of way. There is a movement that has been made a number of times by vehicles. I, I won't comment if it's Mr. Shoemaker's because I, I've also heard comments from members of the public that landscaping and other vehicles use this right of way tract to access the canal. The Lake Worth Drainage District also could be using it. You know, that it does loop onto Mr. Shoemaker's property, but I, I won't say that Mr. Shoemaker is the only person. Well, or and I would say potentially from a technical standpoint, the driveway would be the portion encompassed on his own property. Correct. And the portion of drivable area would just be the right of way that the city owns. So technically, I think the portion that's in the existing right of way would not be considered his driveway because it's not on his property. Right. But he has full use of it as a driveway. It's a city right of way. So any vehicle could, in theory, as long as it's compliant with the deed restrictions, which is for, you know, right of way for public purposes, that's fine. Yeah. It's like the best of all worlds, (laughs) the way it is now. (laughs) Um, At any rate. I've said my piece. I think everybody's asked. Um, I think we lost Ms. Morrison. I think we lost Ms. Morrison somewhere along the way, but hopefully she'll be back in a minute. Can, you know, does anybody want to take a stab at a motion on this? I, I'd like to. I'd just like to move a recommendation of denial to the City Commission of Resolution 59-22 to abandon an 80-foot wide right-of-way totaling approximately 17,059 square feet located adjacent to the northern terminus of Davis Road by adopting the findings of fact and law contained in the staff report and finding that the request and approval thereof is consistent with the comprehensive plan and meets the criteria of, isn't consistent, well, whatever. It meets the criteria set forth in the land development regulations. Second. Let the record show motion by Ms. Howell, second by Ms. Blankenship. Should we pause a moment, Mr. Bennett, and wait for Ms. Morris? I think that, that'd be appropriate. Thank you. I, thank you. And just a, a reminder, as the motion says, this is merely a recommendation. So Correct. the application still goes before city commission. So they'll, they'll have a hearing and make a determination for anybody in the public or you know, for the applicant's sake to know that. Can we discuss this motion at all while we're waiting? So we technically have a second. Uh, 
We already have a second, technically. You want to do a friend? Oh, here's Miss Morrison. Here's Ms. Morrison. Ms. Morrison's going to need to. Ms. Morrison. Yes, sir. Welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> um, Ms. Howell made a motion to deny, and it was so seconded by Ms. Blankenship for, and just to be accurate, the motion was a complete denial um, for the city to basically retain the right of way. Mm. Okay? And it's motion and seconded, and we waited for you before we called the roll. Do you want to take a minute and think about it? Nope, I'm good. You're good. Okay, Ms. Miller, please call the roll. Rob Long? Yes. Joy Howell? Yes. Helen Zeller? Yes to deny. Christina Morrison? Yes to deny. Max Weinberg? No. Julian Blankenship? Yes. Chris Davey? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Rutcher. Thank you, Ms. Shoemaker. <clears throat> and with that, <laughs> going to come into item number 8B is in Bravo. Born famous, file number 2020-029. Before we start on this item, can I ask, has there been any ex parte communication on this item? We'll start with you, Ms. Morrison. Well, I know the site very well, and I did my normal research through the uh, property appraiser's office and through the state of Florida. Ms. Howell? Drove by the site. <clears throat> Drive by it every day. No. Mr. Long? I drive by and I've been to the, the bar before. Mr. Zeller, I visited the site as well. I drive by it, let the record show that. Thank you. Hi, good evening, um, Jennifer Buse, uh, planner for the city. And if I made a mistake, it is uh, file number 2021-009. If I could just interrupt for one moment. I seem to have lost internet connection. Yeah, me too, I can't get on the agenda. Same. Can't access the staff report. It went dead. You know what? Um, let's take a quick five minute recess while we have IT take a look at this. Let the record show it is 844, excuse me, 644, and we'll reconvene at uh, 650. Yeah. It's a bad, bad <laughs> slip of the tongue. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
Here I am. Yeah, we're ready. You can't see my tattoos, can you?
We're waiting on Diane. I think Diane just needs to hit the lights with the microphone switch. I don't need it. In your garage. <laughs> <laughs> I think. I know you would. <laughs> you should, they should wear the mic around Please. their around their <laughs> neck. <laughs> Longer neck. <laughs> All set? Yeah. Great. Let, let the record show it is 6.54 p.m. The City of Delray Beach Planning and Zoning <laughs> Meeting of May 16, 2022 is reconvening and all members are present in the chamber. Okay. So Ms. Jennifer Buse. Buse <laughs> Thank um, you. Um, with Planning and Zoning Planner. Um, this is file number 2021-009 um, and this is the porn famous at 524 West Atlantic for conditional use and the applicant is Hello. Thank you all. I hope to make this both efficient and simple for you. My name is Chalo Shot. I'm a resident of Boynton Beach, 2410 Venetian Way. Um, we are here because uh, we got sidelined by COVID, uh, as many did. We made the investment in capital and time to convert to be a full service restaurant. When we reopened, we learned that we would lose our ability to operate until 2 a.m. It has uh, become an insurmountable challenge over the past six months to change public perception of what our property is. It's existed as a late night establishment for over 60 years. And we would like to return to the operating hours that we had for all of those years. This again is not asking anything out of the norm. It's the interior only. We operate out of the north side door. There should not be any concerns. We'll address them as they come up if they do. So there has been question before in the city uh, about whether a bar might convert to become a restaurant to use their outside patio and pretend to be a restaurant. Uh, we're not pretending. Uh, I was fortunate enough to just get published in print and food and beverage magazine. That's a global publication. We're the real deal. We're really working hard over there. Um, the total site uh, is mostly exterior. We're allowed to operate the outside now as a restaurant until 10 p.m. during the week, uh, 11 p.m. on the weekend, and we educate everyone about our hours and we invite patrons back inside. Because people don't normally like rules, we do lose a lot of business because of that, but we're not complaining. That's the way it is, and uh, we're still happy to function in our neighborhood. We do, however, need the additional hours inside. We do support the neighboring community. They are happy to have a food option late night. They do feel slighted that it is not late night enough, as many other businesses are in the area, and they'd like something other than just fast food. Uh, an expensive, 
well, we're going to skip slides. I don't have the entire text. I am standing in for Glenn that was noted on the. Uh, do I have the ability to slide on the screen? Thank you very much. So we're showing again the the service pathways inside. Everything directed at the left there is north. So directly north of us, we'll see in photos is the fire department. The ad only adjacent residential property uh, of about six feet that we have an easement with for emergency exits is under same ownership. They invested in sound barriers. They invested in impact doors and windows and noise will not be an issue. Again, this is the same uh, business program going back uh, to 1956. We also researched and found zero noise complaints within the last 10 years. A lot of these are requirement as part of the application. Th there's other bars that are now converting to restaurants. I think this might be a process you guys become more familiar with. We're just probably the first one. This is showing the alley view looking north uh, behind us, uh, looking south. That's right on Atlantic Avenue. I'm sure you can notice a building next to uh, the Libby Wesley Plaza. Looking east and looking west. Uh, one of our uh, business neighbors, Sean and Son, you, sh you can hardly see us through uh, the lush greenery, but uh, the mural does pop out a little bit there. These are the apartments to the southwest of us. Again, under the same ownership, you can see the new roof, new doors, new windows. Um, I've even have my employees in the closest proximity apartments um, to avoid issues. So some uh, notes were about the noise buffer. We've invested significant time, energy, and, and landscaping dollars into it to ensure that there are sufficient noise buffers. In my opinion, these are irrelevant. Again, we close the outside at 10 p.m. during the week, 11 p.m. on the weekends, and all traffic, uh, foot traffic, leaves through the north door, not through the back. There's no uh, casual smoking outside. There's no anything outside. We're not allowed to use it. Uh, as you see there, we've made an attempt to become very tropical. It's a, a, a significant noise buffer. Uh, you can't even see through. So on the other side of uh, all of that is the Libby Wesley Plaza. Um, some concerns about the property in the past, how it was developed and used. Uh, I'm becoming a bit of a designer myself. Uh, the, the setup is more like a wine garden now. Uh, the chairs are all out of the Jupiter Colony Inlet Beach Club. They're dated back from the 60s. Just some cool charm thing that uh, I enjoy. Again, we'll try to move quickly through uh, what was a large presentation for you. Again, most of the exterior is um, the patio. So the building is positioned at the far north end of the property, putting us furthest away from any neighbors if there's a concern about noise to address again. Uh, to the left is uh, Bear's Food Shack. We do not have any parking requirements, but if this is a concern, again, we're trying to address any concerns that may arise. You can see us there. I chose that gold star because we're the best. Uh, you have the, the large, although somewhat confusing to find at times, city parking lots in green. And we're fortunate enough to have free parking on both the north and south sides of Atlantic Avenue, uh, essentially all the way from 95 to Swinton. So there's not going to be any concern about additional parking. Again, all we're asking is to go back in time six months and retain the 2 a.m. closing period that we had before. This is what I touched on already, I'm trying to be quick for you, uh, that we do on the residential property. Um, if there's any concerns we could discuss, uh, because that, that photo is not that clear and how it's presented. Um, where the overlap is, we do have an emergency fire exit on the south end. So right where the top blue arrow cuts over, we have an easement there. If uh, there should ever be a scenario that we need to pass through, uh, we can. Again, there's many slides that are, are probably more important for our next meeting with the city to ensure them that we are a bona fide restaurant. 
including things like our full menu, photos of our food, particular things. Uh, we have not found any conflicts. Uh, we've we find that uh, just as it operated for over 60 years, we are consistent with the CBD requirements. Concurrency, the restaurant uh, does not have any ill effects on the city whatsoever. It does not require any capital improvements. Um, if Henry from Clean and Safe was here, he would tell you that there are no trash or loitering issues. There are no security issues. We also feel that it's consistent with all of the city's missions uh, with recommendations that have been made. And I'm a very awkward height to read some of these slides. And uh, again, we'll, to support the growth, we're, we're asking for the same opportunity that others have. We, we just want to be successful. This has been a very big challenge. I guess I'm a celebrity. I'm going on TikTok. <laughs> Who's that? So some of the more, uh, some of the issues that pertain more to us specifically, I have employees that are amazing. I've got employees that are working in hospitality with four-year degrees, with marketing degrees. They can make more money working at the downtown businesses that are allowed to open until two. This is a thriving economic hub. They're working for me because they believe in the things I do, but they're not going to work for me forever if we can't get the 2AM license back. It's costing them money on a daily basis. Um, a friend of mine next door at Bears fully supports us. I've included his letter here, as well as Bill Caesar. Uh, if there was more time to go on, I'm sure that I could get continued support from every other business in the area. We've got a very unique culinary scene growing just a couple blocks away. Um, it may not have all the, uh, you know, style points as some of the other locations, but it's good. And uh, we enjoy being over there. It's a working class area, good people, good food. We want to just be able to, like I said, have the same opportunities that others do in the city and operate our business within the the statutes and guidelines the city gives us just until 2 a.m. inside. We've touched on these already. No noise complaints. We have been open until 2 for many years. I think you're done hearing me say that. We want to continue to invest in Delray Beach. We want to grow our business, serve the needs of the community. It's exactly what we're here for. I appreciate everyone's time. I'm available for questions. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. And can I just ask, um, for the record, what is your um, affiliation or position with the business? Uh, so I own and operate multiple restaurants within the city. This one is an operation deal. So I have a management company that is operating this business on behalf of the owners. Perfect. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, great. If you could stay there, we'll be probably be back to you in a couple of moments. Ms. Puse? Hi. So this is item or agenda item 8B. It is Porn Famous at 524 West Atlantic Avenue, and it is a conditional use. So the current use is restaurant. It is in the CBD Central Business District within the West Atlantic Neighborhood Subdistrict. And the conditional use is to operate as a 24-hour or late-night business after midnight until 2 a.m., seven days a week for the indoor dining area of the restaurant. Um, as stated before, it was built in 1956, most famously known as Clearview Lounge. And yes, I did find a photo. Operated um, as a standalone bar under several different names um, after Clearview, such as Vintage Tap, Bearded Rooster, and Porn Famous. Uh, December of 2021 became a bona fide restaurant. Why are they here tonight? Um, pursuant to LDR section 433-VV3B, any 24 late night business which is inexistent at the time of the adoption of an ordinance requires them when they do a change of use from one type of uh, late night business to another, they have to come back in for a um, uh, another conditional use. So they switch from a standalone bar to a restaurant. So that's the change of use which required them to come back in. 
So how did Porn Famous become a restaurant? They went before uh, Sprab in November of 2020 uh, with a class three site plan for the change of use. They were approved. Um, and then at city commission, um, city commission appealed their decision on December 8th, 2020. And then the request was approved with conditions which limited their outdoor dining at the time no later than 10 p.m. Sunday through Thursday and 11 p.m. Um, Monday through uh, Saturday and Sunday um, and additional landscaping to the rear of the property. So the definition for a late night business is any restaurant, bar, lounge, nightclub, music hall, club, gasoline station, convenience store, uh, business retail store, um, that wants to stay open until after 12 p.m. or 12 a.m. I'm sorry and pursuant to LDR VV 2A it requires that a 24-hour late night business located or proposed to be located within a 300 foot straight line route from any residentially zoned property shall obtain a conditional use and so this is the 300 foot route and this is the residential RM which includes these two properties. Everything else within here is either CBD, you also have the Wibley, Libby Wesley which is um, community facilities and the fire department. <coughs> so your required fi findings um, state that it will not have a significant detrimental effect upon the neighborhood and hinder development or nearby properties. So here's the fire department across the street, which is CF, and um, stated again, um, Libby, Libby Wesley Park, um, which is um, CBD, and Bears, which is CBD, and then Porn Famous here is CBD, and behind them is the Strawn Funeral Home, which is also um, zoned CBD. So with the purpose, the NLDR 4413A3, which comes out of our CBD regulations, the purpose and intent of West Atlantic Neighborhood Subdistrict is to preserve and enhance existing neighborhoods while promoting a pedestrian friendly commercial area along the West Atlantic Avenue, which contains um, a mix of residential, uh, commercial and civic function. And additional review and consideration is required to ensure that when extended hours of operation are introduced, that um, the request within 300 feet of residentially zoned property is, benef is beneficial to the community rather than, rather than creating a nuisance. Could the extended hours inside during the week affect the nearby properties? Traditional work week, these are things that you should consider. Um, parking is not a requirement in this district, and this was um, done through ordinance number 0120. There is on-street parking available, and again, there are the several different parking lots that are available. This ordinance is in effect unless somebody um, amends it until the year 2023. And after that, if Porn Famous came in and did a second story on top, they would have to provide parking. So the required findings is land use, map, concurrency, consistency, and compliance. And the, um, it does meet the land use map, which is CBD, and the land use map is um, central, uh, central Core. And the concurrency <coughs> um, was met as well. That's the traffic. That's a new report. Um, that was done through the class three, um, and nothing has changed since then. And your consistency are the um, elements, and there are several elements. And then the compliance with the L LDRs requires a security plan and um, buffering. So um, you do have the security plan in your backup material, but just briefly, there's 14 cameras which are internal and external, and they maintain their um, recordings for five years. There is an alarm that acts, activates after the close of business. Daily documentation is done 
um, for maintenance, opening and closing. There is external light, lighting provided um, on the photometric which you have and emergency exit is provided to the rear of the property. The buffering is enclosed with a six foot, six foot fence on the south um, and a metal fence on the west portion of the property. As stated before, the class three was approved with the condition to add more landscaping to the rear of the property to buffer potential noise. These are findings within 433VV2C. Um, these need to be considered. These are additional findings on 244C, which um, the board can impose conditions um, in granting approval to any development application um, if they are looking at the compatibility of use with nearby existing and proposed uses, the concurrency, the consistency um, with objectives and policies with a comprehensive plan, the fulfillment of the land development regulations. So with the findings to LDR 433VV2C, things to consider. Does the proposal extended hours comply with housing policy 1.1.12 as it relates to noise, traffic volumes to the adjacent areas? Should the extended hours of operation be allowed seven days a week until 2 a.m.? And should additional buffering be installed to the rear of the property to absorb potential noise um, and provide additional screening? It was reviewed by the DDA and they recommended approval the request was written into the, um, to received by the Community Redevelopment Agency in the April report. Um, this went out to the neighborhood associations for a courtesy notice and it was publicly noticed. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Ms. Buse. You want me to do that now? Really quickly? Please. There's, um, a glitch in the, the um, staff report when you're making your decision. Um, C is move denial of the conditional use. It says in the staff report, it says move denial um, to recommend to city commission. So this is where you're gonna take your, your um, can't even think of the word right now, your, your motion. Right, in other words, we'd have to insert that language if yes, we were please. to choose C. Yes, please. Thanks, Ms. Buse. <laughs> Thank you so much. Now, I'll turn to uh, the public. Are there any members of the public here this evening who would like to speak on this item? Chair, I believe um, Ms. Fence came in after the swearing in, and we may have some new people as well. So if sure. Diane can just <clears throat> do another swearing in for anybody that arrived late. And Thank Diane, you, I think Bennett. Ms. Miskell is grabbing some people from the lobby. <coughs> Sir, excuse me, were you sworn? No. Oh, if you could just stand, the board secretary, if you wish to speak on an item this evening and you have not been sworn, please rise and be sworn now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Pinst? Yes. Hmm, I think. Okay. Is, is this mine? No, that's not yours. That's Ms. Buse left that there. Okay. Um, okay. The provision is a late night business till 2 a.m., right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. We own property down there on four. Okay. So I think I can speak about keeping something open to 2 a.m. is impacting the adjacent neighborhoods. And I think you need to think seriously about that because it's all residential one street down. And to put this thing open to 2 a.m is impacting more than just one little house. It's impacting the whole neighborhood and that whole strip along there because people will be getting into their cars at 2 a.m., probably not too quietly. 
and uh, getting lost and driving through the rest of the neighborhood. And uh, I think you need to leave it the way it is. Okay. Not till 2 a.m. Thank you. Thank you for taking care of me. <laughs> At any rate, um, 2 a.m. is too late. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Yes, sir. We would ask if you could please approach the microphone and state your name and address for the record, please. My name is Scott O'Donnell. I live at 1850 Lake Drive in Del Rey. It's the Lake Ida section uh, to the north. Um, I, over the years, have patronized this facility a number of times. And when it was open past 12, I can tell you, pulling up on my golf cart, I couldn't hear a thing until the door was opened. Um, and now it's closing at 12. I would love uh, to be able to take my wife and my kids there to get something better than uh, the fast food burgers down the street uh, after, after midnight. So I strongly support uh, this facility staying open past midnight. Thank you so much, sir. Have a good evening. Anybody else wishing to uh, make a public comment on this item? Seeing no one else stepping forward, public comment can be closed. Um, I would now ask uh, you, sir, and Ms. Buse, do you have any cross-examination or rebuttal for each other? Uh, is, is the rebuttal allowed for something that was just stated from the public? If you'd like to. There is no parking in the neighborhood south or north on the streets, so I don't believe that patrons would park in those areas. They would choose to stay on Atlantic, and I do believe Atlantic is a very noticeable street, and I don't see any reason why people would meander throughout the neighborhoods uh, before or after visiting us. Uh, and just to clarify, there is no street side parking. There's no, there's nowhere anyone would park. It wouldn't, it wouldn't happen. Okay, thank you. Ms. Buse? I do not. No cross-examination or rebuttal. Okay, thank you. I'll turn to my colleagues on the board then. And uh, does anybody have any comments or questions on this item? Who wants to start it off? Well, I will. Thank you, Mr. Weinberg. <laughs> I uh, think that any project that aids and abets the West Atlantic Redevelopment Program as can in the always Delray comp plan is a good thing. Bringing people to that area, um, I, while I haven't had any ex parte communication other than driving down Atlantic Avenue and seeing the mural, uh, the fact that it uh, operated at these later hours uh, as a bar with the addition of food, uh, this is a similar type of application as we had down at the other end of uh, Atlantic Avenue. Uh, the concern, of course, is people not wanting to uh, leave the outside area and come inside. So the only question, I would, I, while I'm in favor of uh, allowing this uh, conditional use, the question I would have would be to, uh, how, how is that policed? How is that enforced that people in the middle of their meal, should it be 1205, come inside. So we're not the only facility now in town that operates this way. Uh, so the, the locals have come to understand the rules and regulations that the city has set forth. Uh, it's not unlike a larger city that has to respect neighbors, even like New York City or something. There's no, it's not the type of environment either where people are going out of their way to be loud. It's not a <laughs> nightclub. Uh, we're not selling bottles. We're not selling this like, insane, vibrant uh, uh, setup. Um, it's, it's rather calm. Uh, people just simply aren't outside. We, we have staff that informs them that these are the rules, uh, and it's for the city's benefit, and it's for the neighbor's benefit, and we invite them inside. Like I said earlier, they don't always stay. Sometimes just that abrupt change, they leave. Um, that's not something we can control. We can just try to you know, make them happier as we go. So that's already a challenge of ours. The 2 a.m. closing was a uh, previous condition that was approved, or at least it was operational that way, right? Yes, just since uh, we wanted to invest again and become a restaurant, we wanted to avoid 
something like the pandemic coming again, where all bars were forced shut. Um, and we wanted to offer something else to the area too. But this is a question from Mr. Bennett. Would this apply solely to this business? Well, so the conditional use, yes. I mean, this is just for this particular business, this particular application. So it wouldn't have any widespread ramifications or be applicable to, to all properties. It's a conditional use. Okay, thanks. That's all I have. Anybody else? Thank you, Mr. Weinberg. Anybody else? Ms. Blankenship. Thank you. Um, the outside use area, it's my understanding that the applicant um, became a restful bona fide restaurant so they could use that outdoor space because a standalone bar is not permitted to do so. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Um, I, I'm just not in favor of the request pursuant to LDR section 2.4.5 E5. Uh, I think it will have a significantly detrimental effect on the neighborhoods within 300 feet of residential um, neighborhood. And in my opinion, you know, if it's going to be a bona fide restaurant, then uh, the 10 p.m. and the 11 p.m. closing times respectively uh, is instituted by the commission. Um, are fine with me. Well, I, I do want to add some clarification to that. Sure. So the restaurant by right can be open till midnight. It's the outdoor use areas that have to close at those designated hours. So the restaurant is still operating until midnight. And this request does not include the outdoor use area. That would be a site plan amendment, mm -hmm. um, which they'd have to go forward with. But that's not before you. So this is just the interior use and to extend it from midnight to 2 a.m. Thank you for the clarification, yes. Mr. So if I can take that one step for, further, if they wanted to change the hours for the out, outdoor use, it would be another conditional use. Thank you, Ms. Buse. And we do not. Can I ask a point of clarification? I just want to jump in. This business within the past two years was granted the ability by the city commission to stay open until 2 a.m. as a standalone bar? Not to my knowledge. No. Okay, so they have bar. never been open. Yes, as a standalone bar, yes. But the LDR state, once you do a change of use, you have to reapply and do a brand new conditional use for that use. Right. So, but this business up until last year had been open without food until 2 a.m.? Mm-hmm. Bar, standalone bar. Standalone bar. So they'd been open at 2 a.m., Without now, the outside use. They just want to the abil as a as an indoor use, correct? Mm -hmm. As an indoor use. Yes. And now they're seeking to add food and still remain inside until two AM. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Just Can seems I get a clarification please, please. on the parking um, and the walking um, around the area is Am I understanding that that doesn't happen? Where do people park? Well, so those slides is my slide still here available? I have the entirety of Atlantic Avenue on both the north and south sides with free parking. Also within one block, there are three city parking lots. We have significant amounts of parking. It's just not as clear and evident as a giant garage. <laughs> They're adjacent to residents. In the neighborhoods. Yeah, they're behind the pl they're behind the firehouse. Mm -hmm. um, no, they're up. They're behind this. They're, they're behind this operation on the side street, which is adjacent to residential. Right. right. Disability. Are those not all CBD? Those are my neighboring businesses, especially on the south side. There, those are not homes. This is across from the police department, right here. So let me just understand, Mr. Bennett, we, we've been recently encountering other establishments who've been kind of going down this road. Is it, is it correct to say that other than this one, the, the others have, the, the ones who currently have the ability to stay open later are within the entertainment district boundaries. Is that correct? I don't know if I would say that's correct. I'm not familiar with every application, but you know, the, the entertainment district I really would direct the board to stay away from the entertainment district because the entertainment district doesn't allow louder noise or more pedestrian traffic or those issues. All it allows is for noise to happen later. Um, that that's it. So it doesn't allow there to be more noise. It's just that noise can noise can be um, 
later into the evening. And we're really looking at these, the particular findings. If it, you, they do are required, <clears throat> apologize here, they are required to have um, these bufferings and security plans, and those are requirements. Those aren't conditions that you're imposing. That's something they will have to comply with um, if the conditional use is granted from it's being granted until it's no longer in use. The housing element policy is where you're talking about there not being uh, noise or odor or things of that nature. So some of what you're discussing could be um, housed within that housing element. But the parking itself um, is not really before you because they're not changing their use. They're not changing their intensity of use. They're just changing. We're asking to extend the hours of use. Yeah, I'm just the reason I was asking about that was for the neighborhood impact. Is there neighborhood impact from the later hours? If I'm understanding you, it's been open until 2 a.m., functioning as a bar previously for how many years? Since 1956. No short run. Also, just uh, to clarify, I know I've said it before, there's assumptions being made about noise. There's never been a noise complaint in 10 years, so I have evidence uh, encountered to that. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? I have concern about, about it as well. I mean, we apparently had this application before SPRAB that the city chose to um, appeal the decision of SPRAB a year and a half ago, and then they limited the hours of this operation, of this business. There's a new noise ordinance that's being considered by the city as we speak. Um, I think the city should be the ones to decide whether or not this is, this is appropriate for this area. There's the residents across the street, um, just to the east of, of um, on Atlantic Avenue, above those stores on, on Atlantic Avenue. I believe there's condos, there might be offices up there, but there's certainly condos in. Uh, noise is a concern. The city obviously had some concern because they limited the hours of operation, and I think it would be appropriate to let the noise ordinance play out and the city determine what is appropriate because it's always a slippery slope when you extend the hours of operation to one business, then another one comes in, and then another one comes in. Um, and yes, they're not supposed to be precedential, but they, in effect, are because the arguments that we hear are that, well, you let this one do it or this one can do it, and why can't you let us do it? So uh, that's my concern. Thank you, Mr. Zeller. Let me just state that um, I have concerns about this too. Um, We've discussed on other issues, on other items before this board regarding within the late night hours, within the entertainment district, outside the entertainment district. When I look at um, the situation, I'm going to be candid here. Um, I don't really understand how the city commission reached their decision on this a couple of years ago, but that's fine. I don't have to. What, you know, I am not prepared to support this this evening, but I have faith in the fact that the city commission figured this out a year and a half ago when it was appealed from the SPRAB board. Let them figure it out again. Um, this, because of the location, the size of the building, there's so many things I think that are make me worried about approving this, even though you applicant uh, the applicant um, states for the, on the record that the property has not received a noise complaint in 10 years um, as I said it's outside of the uh, entertainment district in our downtown there is residential behind it which is currently owned by the bar but there is the residential um, close to that and um, 
it's, you know, I can't support this now when I look at the concurrency and the other issues that are there, and I look at our LDRs, but um, obviously the city commission had a way of looking at this approximately a year and a half or two years ago, and they can look at it again. Chair, there's one thing yes. I wanted to clarify. Just the, the operational limitations that city commission placed are only on the outdoor area. So the, the commission placed no limitations on the interior operation of the business. And, and that's what they're looking at. So just wanted to make sure that it's clear that those limitations were solely on the outdoor area, not on the interior. So the city commission ruled, let's say, two years ago, Mr. Bennett, that they could be open till 2 a.m. every night of the week. No. no, I and I clarify that some. I, I don't know the exact year it was approved, but they have been operating till two a.m. for a substantial amount of time. Um, so that wasn't something that's only been around for for two years. What happened two years ago was the class three site plan where they changed their use from the standalone bar, which was legally operating till two a.m. Right to be a bona fide restaurant, which allowed them to access their outdoor use space. And so, city commission uh, ultimately approved that outdoor use space but determined that the outdoor use needed to stop by 10 p.m. or 11 p.m., depending on the day of the week. It made no limitation on the interior operations of the business. So today, because they, even though they've been historically open till 2 a.m. for a significant amount of time, because they've had a change of use, they're required to come back and ask for permission to stay open till 2 a.m. again. So they're, they're back because of Only that Only difference change. they're so basically what you're telling me is the only difference is they're going to start serving food on the inside. Well, there'll be a, a bona fide restaurant, which has more than just simply food is served, but, but that is the major distinction between a bona fide restaurant and a standalone bar. But the outside is not going to be open any later. That's correct. It will still be required to close by 10 okay. p.m. or 11 p.m. pursuant to the limitations placed by city commission. This is solely for interior operation. Okay, if that's the case, I can, I can support that. I can support that. If that's what the city commission has allowed in the past and he's just changing to a restaurant and the outdoor use is going to remain the same, I can support that. Yeah, there will be, this, this application will make no modifications to the outdoor use area. Okay, thank you for clarifying that, Mr. Ben, that I appreciate it. I would, I would just say. Please. Um, that, uh, Although they had been enjoying the 2 a.m. close time as a standalone bar, I would say that that probably conditional use or however they were grandfathered in was something, you know, I believe that the city may have evolved their thought process about, uh, you know, the 2 a.m. close time um, in 20, you know, pursuant to now the evolution of the code um, is significantly different than it was 50 years ago or 60 or ago. whatever right. the space was. Can I ask, um, we're not the final word on this, correct, Ms. Buse? So, this is may, maybe. <laughs> um, the way the code reads is that they go to city commission with a recommendation of approval. Um, if a recommendation of denial is passed by this board, it will be considered a final action and it is appealable. So the applicant could appeal, if they desire, to city commission this recommendation of denial. <laughs> that is the way that land development regulations currently work. So if this board gives a recommendation of approval or even a recommendation of approval with conditions. If that's something the board wanted to talk about, it will travel onward just automatically to city commission for consideration. Is it not, um, we've been in this position before where we um, are faced with a conditional use and we want the city commission to decide or lead the way and then that's not appropriate either, is it Mr. Bennett? I do not think so. Um, that's an authority that's vested in this board. And if the board were just to say, we should recommend approval just so that city commission gets the opportunity to to vote or consider the item you're in essence deferring your authority to city commission so this board should look at the five combined findings between the late night use and conditional use and make a vote uh, based upon those findings may i say one last thing since everyone's being very candid, I appreciate the thought that you're giving to this. I was with members of the North and South neighborhoods earlier. A lot has been taken from them, and they don't want to see that continue. We are doing something that impacts the locals. I know you heard one opinion tonight from a very nice individual um, that was counter to that. 
There are supporters on both sides of the Atlantic in those historic neighborhoods that don't want any more things taken from them. Thank you, sir. I would like to add, if I might, and reiterate my belief that this board should uh, try to find a way to implicate, to um, begin to really address the meaning of the West Atlantic redevelopment and give every consideration that it can at this level to rather than chilling the effect of new businesses or existing businesses uh, chance of success in their area to really uh, give them the opportunity to uh, to be good neighbors and I would personally in that area like to see more people on the street late at night. We do have the entertainment district and we've dealt with this such as the issue a few months ago with the Bounce uh, Club in Atlantic Crossing. Um, code enforcement is there to make sure that uh, noise is controlled if there is any noise. As the gentleman has indicated there has not been a complaint in 10 years. And with the um, creation of Sunday Village being the eastern end of the West Atlantic redevelopment area, I do believe that anyone who's willing to take a shot and continue operating, particularly in this environment post-COVID, should be given every consideration to prove that uh, they are deserving of that, which I think uh, this business uh, has. I also think that uh, having been a denizen of standalone bars as a as an employee, let's say, <laughs> I think you're less likely to have an issue with a restaurant than you are uh, just a shot in a beer or bar, which I have no objection to. But I do think that that if the, the and I've said this before that a lot of our LDRs are a little behind the times with relation to the always Del Rey comp plan. And I, I think some relief has to be uh, given to uh, areas that are at risk, like this area, uh, to uh, uh, show that they can, they can exist comfortably within the neighborhood. It's not an overly residential air, air area, and it is right on Atlantic Avenue. Um, not the least of which is I think the police station is two blocks away, so... Uh, there are always patrols in that area. So my, my, my uh, opinion and my vote would be to approve this and, and, uh, and let them uh, prove otherwise, which I, I'm confident they won't prove that they're not a good business in this area to be open inside, you know, and have their big security guys pick people up from the outside and pull them into the inside. That's my two cents. Can I Thank you, Mr. Ask? Weinberg. Please, Ms. Howell. back for a second. Please. Um, Mr. Bennett, the, the precedent setting aspect of this, I mean, there are people who do think, yes, we have an entertainment district. We would like to see late night development in that district, and we'd like to see quality restaurants like this one outside that district, but not operating at late night hours. Well, from a precedent standpoint, you know, every single piece of property is different. Your neighbors are going to be different. Your zoning is going to be different. There may not be another applicant that comes before you for the next 10 years. It's directly across from a fire station and two blocks away from a police department. So everything's different. Um, so you don't, I would cast those concerns aside. Each application stands on its own. The, and again, with the entertainment district, it's about being, having a certain level of noise for a longer period portion of the evening it's not about how late they can operate it's not about what uses are allowed you know so this late night business can operate till 2 a.m if that's a conditional use it's granted but they still have to comply with the noise regulations which if they're outside of the entertainment district would be midnight and not later so they would still have it would still be a code compliance issue and they would be required to be uh, quieter earlier than their neighbors potentially in the entertainment district and I think that's where the applicants you know done his diligence to inform you he's asked for co-complaints in the last 10 years 
Um, during that time, other than their conversion to a restaurant, they were a standalone bar open till 2 a.m. Sorry, just one more thing. We actually aren't setting a precedent. Checkers is already operating past midnight in the area, and they're not an interior restaurant. We aren't the first. Thank you, sir. Yeah, um, no, I appreciate that, Mr. Bennett. And, you know, as I think about this, I'd be more concerned if this was a restaurant adding liquor that was going to be open till 2 a.m. But this is a bar that has been open till 2 a.m that we're basically adding food to, correct? We thought we were doing a good thing. <laughs> so, ready? Yes, if you're ready, Ms. Morrison. I just have to clarify Please. two things. Um, it's our job, according to the LDRs, to promote the health, safety, and general welfare of the citizenry in a certain area that we're considering, and to provide conditions upon the use of 24-hour late-night businesses in order to minimize the impact of surrounding residential zone properties. My concern is Atlantic Crossing, Atlantic um, Crossing that um, was negatively impacted by the 404 bar, and that was just two blocks away. I would hate to see them be negatively impacted again. Um, but yet, I think this uh, con this conditional use has some um, has some veracity. So I would like to propose a um, compromise. Uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday open till 2 a.m., and the rest of the week close at midnight. Um, the entertainment district doesn't have those, those uh, restrictions, but that's a certain area of town that's proven, and it's very well regulated, lots of police, lots of uh, clean and safe officers, things like that. I would be willing to uh, permit the Friday, Saturday, and Sunday 2 a.m., but I'm not so sure that I would be fulfilling my job, according to the LDRs, to protect the surrounding neighborhood to allow it during the rest of the week. Anybody else? No, excuse me. Anybody else? Any comments? I think that's an interesting that's compromise. It. Well, Mr. Weinberg, anybody? Ms. Seller? Well, if somebody wants to take a shot at a motion. I'll take a shot at a motion. Go ahead, Mr. Chair, Weinberg. just I think our Oh, Ms. Alvarez, did you? Actually, yes. Oh. I would like a clarification on the hours. If that is the way that you're going to go with the motion, um, Ms. Morrison mentioned Friday, Saturday, Sunday until 2 a.m., meaning they're open on Thursday, close Friday at 2 a.m. <laughs> I, I, just, I just want the clarification. Yeah, Do point. we mean until Monday at 2 a.m., actually? You know what I mean? Sure. So just Let's... so that we're clear on which days. <laughs> That's a great point. Mr. Weinberg. As this is a conditional use, I would move to recommend approval to the City Commission and this conditional use request for Porn Famous to allow a 24-hour or late-night business on the conditions they presented at 524 West Atlantic Avenue to be open until 2 a.m. for the inside portion of the restaurant, finding that the request is consistent with the land development regulations and the policies of the comprehensive plan. Second. Was there, I didn't hear any of the conditions, correct? He did not. I did not okay. uh, include did the not. conditions. Okay, just making sure I didn't miss because it. Because it's a conditional use that can be revoked. So condition, that's, that is incorrect. Um, <laughs> a conditional use, we do not have any process currently in our land development regulations that allow or provide the city the ability to revoke a conditional use. Correct. You do have the ability to set a termination date for the conditional use, which you probably saw most recently um, with beach dogs. So if you were concerned that you would like a future look back at this, then you would recommend um, that it, it, the conditional use be approved only for a set amount of time. And then at that point, the applicant would be required to come and apply for a conditional use again. Okay. Can, can I ask Stand Mr. Corrected. Weinberg if he would expand his motion to not only include the comment made by Mr. Bennett, but also the comments made by Ms. Morrison to, to allow on the temporary basis that it be open till 2 a.m. on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday nights. But Sunday night is really Monday morning. I guess that's 
the cons that's the concern, but it's a work night. We can still call it. We can still call it. Uh, I think the com I can on answer. Sunday morning. The friendly amendment. I think the complicating factor. What? If I can comment to Mr. Zeller's comment, the complicating factor is we have become and probably will continue to be a 365 day a year, 24 seven destination, which is why um, I am, I guess, extremely familiar with the uh, incredible pressures on the hospitality industry uh, around the United States in places that are not entertainment destinations to remain open. Uh, and when I think of that element and when I think of the aspirations of the comp plan for the West, Adva West Atlantic redevelopment area, uh, I'll go back to what I said initially uh, that uh, I think this board should endeavor to find a way to uh, allow these businesses to operate, notwithstanding the uh, fact that when, when you look at the 300-foot circle, I, there was one or two multi-use uh, or multi-family uh, uh, that are owned by the same uh, entity. Uh, so I would stand with the, you know, I, I'm not so sure I have an agree uh, uh, agreement on my motion but I do think it's important to break the logjam of a lack of investment in the West Atlantic area. I will just say, uh, Mr. Weinberg, that you know, if if we have a motion on the floor or not, yeah. so we saying, we have a motion on the technically floor. we had, no and, and I was no second. I was going to ask Mr. Weinberg because he made the motion on the presumption the city could take back a conditional use. Correct. There's not been a second to that motion yet. Um, there was a requested amendment that included the time restrictions, which it sounds like Mr. Weinberg has rejected. Right. Um, I will draw so, my motion. Okay. So we're starting with a clean slate at the moment because Mr. Weinberg has withdrawn his motion before a second. Okay. Mr. Does anybody want to take a shot at a motion on this? I'd be happy to try. Let me get to my proper page. Um, move to recommend approval to the City Commission a conditional use request for poor and famous to allow a 24 hour uh, or late night business at 524 West Atlantic Avenue to be open until 2 a.m. for the inside portion of the restaurant. Finding that the request is consistent with the land development regulations and the policies of the comprehensive plan subject to the condition that it only be allowed to be open till 2 a.m. on uh, Friday. Saturday and Sunday till 2 a.m. I'll second. Okay, let the record show motion by Ms. Morrison, second by Ms. Howell. Ms. Miller, could you please call the roll? Rob Long? Yes. Joy Howell? Yes. <clears throat> Alan Zeller? Yes. Christina Morrison? Yes. Max Weinberg? Yes. Julian Blankenship? No. Chris Davey. Yes. Let the record show the motion passed six to one. Thank you, sir. And Ms. Buse, thank you as well. And with that, we can move on to item number 8C. I see Mr. Covelli has been waiting patiently there in the next to last row. <laughs> Mr. Poppy, good evening. Good evening. Uh, for the record, Scott Poppy, planner for the city of Delray. Okay, next item uh, before you is Parks Delray Platt, uh, file number 2019-155, which I am entering into the, the um, record, and Mr. Cavelli is here for his presentation. 
Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Cavelli. Start at any time. <laughs> Mike Cavelli, 1209 South Swinton Avenue in beautiful Delray Beach. Um, what you have in front of you is a major subdivision plat. Um, this is uh, kind of the getting near the end and going to construction. We've had multiple site plan approvals and we have others pending. Um, this is for a project called the Parks of Delray. It's located south of Germantown Road and west of Congress Avenue, a little bit south of Linton Boulevard, or Linton. Um, oops, I went one too many, let me see. Um, this has a master development plan on it that was a condition of uh, a rezoning a number of years back, a couple of years, I think last year. Um, there was a, an amendment that actually parcelized it in this, in this manner. Um, the plat is consistent with the parceling on this master development plan. Um, there's also a phasing plan. Um, and if you look at all the areas in yellow, there was a um, landscaping and infrastructure site plan approved for that. The green and blue area has a site plan approved for that. The mustard color down in the lower left-hand corner and the blue area is in right now for a site plan approval and amendment of class four site plan. Um, the north, uh, which would be the kind of the lower right-hand corner parcel um, is an existing office building. And the other two pink parcels uh, have site plans being prepared for them right now. So. Um, the plat is consistent with the parceling of the master development plan and the phasing plan. We do have certain, uh, some of these approved. Uh, so the, the plat is also consistent with the parceling on the site plans that are approved and pending. Um, the plat is a typical plat with a couple of signature pages. Um, there is, uh, let me see if I can point it out to you, one, you see, a, hard to see, but there's a blue line there that's a drainage easement that's going to the county, and in front of that is right-of-way dedication um, for Congress Avenue, and likewise, right in there, there's another right-of-way dedication that is for the extension of an existing turn lane. Um, all of the parceling that you see on, on the plat is consistent with those ma the master development plan and the site plans. Um, for the sake of expediency, I won't go into the history. Mr. Poppy did a very good job in the staff report of, of going through the history of of the, the approvals that have taken place on this on this project, as well as um, all of the uh, the findings um, in, with regards to this plat, and it is in conformity. Uh, so we concur with the staff report, and and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you, Mr. Govelli. Here, well, uh, staff is beginning a presentation yes. of an ex parte. Ex parte. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. Uh, ex parte. None. Yeah, uh, I pass this site several times a week. Anyway, I've spoken to the gone. principals uh, of the project on numerous occasions, and I've raised questions before this board uh, when the project was first uh, discussed to almost two years ago. I guess you could call that ex parte. Mr. Zeller. Well, I visited the site also several times. However, several times, several <laughs> times, at least <laughs> aside from just driving by. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, <Mr. Walsh. clears throat> but I didn't think I didn't by think by raising it. questions about this site, which I've had significant questions about this site since it first came before this board when I was on the board. It's an ex parte communication, but I have had numerous questions about the site. Yeah. If, if there was, if the item was before the board previously, right. we don't have to stay. That's not an ex parte, correct? That would be ex parte would be communication that's happened outside of the public notice. Since the last public meeting. Yeah. 
Yes. Ms. Morrison? Yeah, I know the site well. I know all the owners well. Yes. Drive by it all the time. Ms. Blankenship. None for me, thank you. Don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody Thank wants you. to travel with me, we're not allowed to do that. <laughs> Forget I said that. <laughs> I drive past it as well. Mr. Poppy, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, essentially, the, this is a, a, a plat uh, for Parks of Delray. Uh, they have received a master development plan approval as well as a rezoning to SAD, which the master plan is associated. You have to have that with the SAD. Uh, and that com comprises the entire development. It is a mixed-use mixed development that consists of residential, office, retail, restaurant. Um, they want to rezone. There are a number of older um, subdivisions, plats on this property. Um, it was mostly known as the Office Depot campus, but it also has the Arbors um, office complex on it. They want to, you know, basically change, get rid of all those plats and create a new plat that has nine parcels. They are providing a right of way dedication, cross access easements, and sidewalk easements, and a common open space easements. There's the the breakdown of the the approved uh, development potential. For the, the mixed use development, that's the entire development. Uh, January 2018, the uh, City Commission approved the first SAD uh, ordinance for this development. There was a subsequent one that basically talked about the, the phasing plan, and, and th this the original one really set out the, the entitlement for the development. Um, Again, it consists of, of several different existing uh, plats that they are consolidating into one plat. A dedication of three tracks for private access and sidewalk easements, two tracks for public right of way purposes, um, that, that's dedication of right of way, and dedication of seven open space tracks throughout the development for the recreational <clears throat> purposes. Uh, as part of the um, Imposition of conditions. Uh, you have compatibility the use with nearby and existing uh, proposed uses, concurrency, consistency with objectives of the comp plan, um, the fulfillment of requirement requirements. Well, these regulations should be should have should have or could have been fulfilled prior to the approved action, but which do, were not due to the uh, conditions beyond the control of the applicant. And finally, the fulfillment of requirements of these regulations, which would could have fulfilled prior to, but re remain outstanding, thus providing that they will be accommodated in a later stage. I think next time I'm just going to say those. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a lot, a lot of verbiage right there. Um, Okay, you require findings again as a future land use map of concurrency, consistency, and compliance with LDRs. As noted in the staff report, um, the, the future land use map and concurrency and consistency and compliance with the LDRs has been previously made as part of the master plan and the SAD rezoning. Um, they are going through a class four. And that hasn't occurred yet, but um, they there's they need to deal with some issues with regard to F dot not F dot the county Palm Beach County Traffic Division, and those that issue needs to be resolved before I can schedule that for a future SPRAD meeting. There's a the plat, Mr. Cavelli. I already showed the plat. We'll go through that again. <coughs> Board options, uh, approval, denial, continue with direction. That concludes our presentation. Thank you, Mr. Poppy. Thank you. That being said, I'll open this up to public comment. Is there uh, any member of the public here this evening who wishes to speak on this item? It's 8C. Seeing no one stepping forward, we'll close public comment. Mr. Gavelli, thank you for stepping back up. And you know what I'm going to ask you, Mr. Poppy. Do you have any cross-examination or rebuttal for each other? I have none. Mr. Gavelli? None here. Thank you, Mr. Poppy. 
And I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Does anybody have any questions, comments, or are we just ready for a motion on this one? I just have one question. Please, Ms. Morrison. Um, has the developer agreed to all the county's conditions on the traffic? There were five major conditions from the county. Um, I could answer that, but I'd actually would uh, suggest that it would be more appropriate coming from Mr. Cavelli. Okay, thank you. Mr. Yes. Cavelli? Yes, um, the, the item that we're, we're dealing with is a, um, there's a cost sharing agreement, and we're trying to get that number from Palm Beach County. We have a meeting set next week to actually get that number, and that's the holdup on traffic, that all the concurrency things are all okay. You've agreed with all the other conditions. You're just trying to figure out who's going to pay for what. Right. Okay. Thank you. That's it, Ms. Morrison? Yes, thank you. Okay. I have a question. Mr. Weinberg. I think this is a, my personal opinion, it's a great project. My uh, discussions with the principals through the uh, years, having the opportunity and the necessity to use uh, Germantown Road a lot every week, um, it goes to Ms. Morrison's question of, um, and I don't know if it's appropriate even for this session tonight, but um, three, four times a week, I make either a left or a right off Germantown Road onto South Congress. And um, I notice in this, and I, and I see, of course, the, the work going on, uh, and I think it's going to be a great project when it's done. Uh, but I believe that very little thought was given to the effect, even by the county mobility experts, of the effect of that many residents and users exiting onto Germantown uh, to either make a left to go uh, west or to make a right to go east. Uh, immediately west of the site, it's one lane. Germantown Road then is one lane in each direction, it does open up a bit. But I guess my question, Mr. Cavelli, would be a view. Do you anticipate any particular problems with people coming out uh, in a northerly direction uh, wanting to, uh, and again, I don't know if it, this is even, should be part of this discussion, but if Mr. Bennett doesn't stop me, <laughs> I would ask, the actual effect of people uh, exiting north, going to the light, and wanting to go either north or south uh, on South Congress. There has been a great deal of discussion with regards to the Germantown Road when we went through the, the SAD. Um, as a matter of fact, we are going to add medians in Germantown Road mm -hmm. so that you cannot make a left turn to go west on Germantown Road. So the neighborhood to the west is preserved from none of the traffic entering from this development using Germantown Road to go out to Linton. They would, they would go to the light to go north. Um, there are two major entrances that go out to Congress Avenue um, that, that have full median cuts. So you can make all turning movements at both of those intersections on on. So, you, so what you're saying is you're not you're not forced to go uh, out onto Germantown to go north on. You no. go out on Congress to make a left. Yes. So that'll relieve Two different places. That should relieve that problem. But we did spend a great deal of time about Germantown Road and protecting the, the residents to the west. I would think because there's so many residents living west of this development, uh, which is moving rapidly. Uh, Early on in the project, we actually met with the different neighbors and talked about their concerns. So that the, that main entrance. So it's a main entrance on Congress. There is a a really two main entrances on Congress. There's there's one um, that will come in f at the mid part of the frontage that goes. Uh, directly into where the rec center and the leasing area is um, on, on one area. And at the south end, there is another full median cut that actually comes into um, another way of getting through the subdivision. All the roadways are connected internally. 
So you can go from anywhere on the site to any of the entrances or exits um, without having to go and circle through like out to the road. And my only concern is exiting north and making a left uh, onto uh, Congress. But what you're saying is that was taken into consideration. These entrances should relieve that yes. potential issue. Yes. Okay. Can I ask a question? Mr. Mr. Zeller, Zeller, please. <clears throat> You're telling us that you really think that's a safe maneuver to exit onto Congress, cut across at least three lanes, and make a left turn going north on Congress. In your view, that's a safe maneuver. Is I'm right? telling you what the county traffic engineering people and <laughs> the traffic engineers no. in our project have said. I think that's foolhardy, but that's my opinion. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Zeller, Mr. Cavalli. Um, any other questions, Mr. Long, Ms. Blankenship? Do we have a motion? Motion to approve the preliminary plat and recommendation of approval to the City Commission for the certification of the final plat for parks of, at Delray. Finding that the request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and meets criteria set forth in the land development regulations. Second. Second by Mr. Long. Second by Mr. Long. Motion by Ms. Morrison. Ms. Miller. Rob Long. Joy Howell? Yes. Pardon? Yes. Thank you. Alan Zeller? Yes. Christina Morrison? Yes. Max Weinberg? Yes. Ellen Blankenship? Yes. Chris Davey? An enthusiastic yes. <laughs> Thank there you, you go, much. Mr. Gavelli. Good luck. Have a good night. Thank you, Mr. Poppy. Yep. I hate to say it, but I think Ledger Star is not working again. Again? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> but do you have the internet? Was Legistar not working before? Yeah, it was Legistar. Ms. Miskell, please approach and we'll try to get our computers working. <laughs> I mean, the internet's working, but no Legistar. Excuse me one second, Ms. E. Send this out. Let's get the Legistar. <laughs> You know what, um, Ms. Miskell, I don't want to hold you up. Uh, we are not able to access our intranet here, our documents from the city. So none of us can pull up the staff reports or any of your supporting documentation. Oh, it just came up? Okay, we're good. We're back in business. Right. Very good. Thank you, Ms. Miskell. Thank you, Excuse Mr. me, Chairman. Ms. Issa? Thank you, Chairman Davey. For the record, Elizabeth Issa, Senior Planner with the Development Services Department, entering into the record city case file number 2021-138, which is the Delray Central Master Development Plan. Yeah, and before you start, Ms. Miskell, I just want to ask my colleagues, any ex parte communication since last month? No. No. Yes, I have. I've spoke to the representative uh, of the applicant. No. Yes, I spoke to both the applicant and staff. Okay, thank you. Ms. Miskell, excuse thank me, you. please go ahead. Anytime well, I did, you're ready. I guess I did speak to staff, but. <laughs> thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Good evening, Bonnie Miskell. And since you received the full presentation um, last month, although I know um, Ms. Morrison may not have, we're going to provide you with sufficient slides and then go into the changes. So we'll get going here. Um, I'm here on behalf of Delray Central. It is a master plan and waiver request. And so let's talk about the summary of revisions and I will give you, I promise, Ms. Morris, and I'll give you more information as well so that you'll understand this better. Just so you understand, I watched the meeting from- Okay, where I excellent, was thank you very much. Boy, you are dedicated. <laughs> you betcha. <laughs> So um, this is an application for the introduction of residential and um, a, a additional commercial into a, an existing office, uh, two office building community. And so the revisions that we made, we did take notes copiously at the last meeting, and we've made some, what we believe, some really significant and positive changes that we hope you'll agree with. Um, we removed additional parking spaces along Congress Avenue. We made the west buffer 100% west. 
compliant. We made the north buffer 100% compliant. We increased the size of the north portion of the east buffer to be less non-compliant. We eliminated the open space waiver altogether so that now the open space actually exceeds the code requirement. We made really technically three landscape islands that were not compliant compliant, and we added decorative pavers at the front of the residential building. So now let's give you, let's walk a little bit through this site again just to refresh your memories. So we're generally the southeast corner of Linton and Congress with a little carve out at the hard corner, approximately 12 acres. As I mentioned before, two office buildings are existing on the site and have been for almost, well, for actually a little more than 40 years. This is what those buildings look like. We have the, the 1615 building, which is a um, larger in footprint two-story building. And we have the 1625 building, which is a four-story building, uh, for a total of approximately 180,000 square feet of office, class B for the most part office. The existing ingress and egress on the site, there are four driveways today that operate at this location and provide ingress and egress to those two buildings. Two of them are full openings. One of them is with a light, a traffic light, which is a Germantown Road Congress intersection. That's on the southern half of the site. And the other full opening is a full median cut, which is for the 16, and I always get the building numbers, the 1615 building at the center of that building. The other two openings on the northern and on the southern ends of the overall site are right in and right out. The, and these are existing conditions. So these two buildings were approved over 40 years ago. They were two separate site plans, two separate sites, two separate buildings. At the time, they were under two separate ownerships. They do not have a connection in between. There's no integration of these two sites. They were separate. So hence why each of them has ingress and egress through a full opening, one a median and the other a traffic light, and they also have right in and right out. And again, the land use is Congress mixed use, and the zoning is MROC. So not to confuse you, because I know you had an item earlier um, this evening, uh, talking about proposed changes to the MROC, just to go over the highlights of what the MROC does allow. Um, if you're within 1,000 feet of tri-rail, you can go up to 50 units to the acre, and there is no workforce requirement. If you're within 1,001 to 2,500, you can go to 40 to the acre, no workforce requirement. This, the, the second, the 1,001 to 2,500, the residential can only occupy 80% of the overall site, whereas zero to 1,000, it can be a freestanding residential building and occupy 100% of the site. Over 2,500, you are limited for residential purposes to 75% of the site, and you are required to give a 20% workforce obligation under the existing regulations, and that is the only one of the three that is required to do workforce. We fall under the, the more than 2,500, so there is a 20% workforce obligation, and there is a proffer of that. Mentioned to you before, two separate site plans, no integration, no connectivity between them. Um, also, what you'll, the red circle that you see on the screen, these were designed under a different code than the MROC is today, and they were designed with different roads and, and um, connectivity standards. The, the, the southern half is where the um, where the major intersection with a light, with a Germantown Road intersection is. The Palm Beach County Traffic Department would never approve this configuration under today's standards because it has parking spaces that are right at the intersection. So if cars are parked on the southern half in those spaces, which are close to the front of the building, those cars backing out would unfortunately conflict with cars coming into the site and would back traffic up and block the intersection. So by integrating the site and obviously removing those parking spaces, right away there is going to be an improvement to the movements within that intersection. 
Okay, so since I, let me just, I may skip over this, but the, what some of you may remember, uh, I, I, I suspect uh, Ms. Morrison will remember this, the MROC regulations and the Congress mixed use um, land use category was really um, created at the point where Office Depot was leaving the city of Delray Beach to go to Boca Raton. And there was going to be a very large parcel across the street that would go dark. And so for other reasons as well, but that was one very important and, and meaningful reason for these regulations to be adopted. So that what the, and I happened to be representing the buyer of the Office Depot site, so we followed this carefully. It was very important to that acquisition. Um, the goal was to provide more flexibility to the corridor to help draw more of an investment onto the corridor. Um, these regulations were adopted, the Office Depot um, sold, property sold, to, and now it's sold a few times over, and actually I think the broker of the last deal is sitting in the room. So this is traded a few times over. But these regulations for, you know, pr principally were intended to stimulate that corridor. And so just to share with you a few of them, um, pro provide for a mix of residential office and commercial in a master plan environment, encourage standalone office buildings and mixed use, use development with commercial or office uses on the ground floor and office or residential uses above and also to provide, most importantly, because the one biggest thing that was added with MROC was a very high level of density would be um, infused into this area between the 40 and 50 to the acre. And, and, and also to emphasize connectivity and use of the transit at the time. Okay, so we'll move along here, all right. So the proposed, now getting into the meat of the matter, and I'll get, go through this very quickly. So the proposed master plan, 271 residential dwelling units um, with an average unit size of 1,000 square feet. As I mentioned to, to you before, because we're over the 2,500, we are required to do a 20% workforce. This actually is the only project that will come in that contributes workforce under the MROC. Um, Altus, I think, was within a thousand, so they weren't required to do that. The workforce, and they also could be freestanding residential. They are not a mixed-use project. Uh, this will be the first one to to actually exercise this particular part of the MROC. Um, uh, as mentioned by your staff report and before, also within the residential building on the first floor is a thousand ninety-five square feet of commercial. Um, non-restaurant. Uh, amenities include a clubhouse with a state-of-the-art fitness center, business center, club and game room, resort-style pool with cabanas and a pool lounge, a tot lot for to toddlers and kids, a shared-use pathway along the CXS, CSX Railroad, enhanced entrance plazas for each of the office buildings which we're adding and also in front of the residential, a pedestrian plaza, plaza pocket parks, and a few other things to, that will uh, that are not not as significant. This is one of the first true mixed use sites under the MROC. This is not one of the projects that was converted to SAD because some of the MROC um, elements are challenging to be able to do. Uh, the project across the street, the Office Depot site, they went SAD because they had a great deal of difficulty with the integration. I, ha I actually happened to help them with that project. The Aura Del Rey went SAD because they also had an integration issue with the commercial. Um, this is one of the few that's come in here, and it is the only one that is mixed use that has come in under MROC. Okay. So I'm going to quickly go through some of our amenities here. There's the pool and cabanas. This is the tot lot and toddlers. And we have a number of plaza areas, as we mentioned. Um, number one is in front of the building to the south, office building to the south. Two are, are pavers and also a plaza area in front of the residential. And three is over in front of the office building on the north side. 
We've also integrated into the site where there was none, pedestrian connections, uh, more sidewalks. Uh, there's obviously the um, all-purpose path that runs along the CSX Railroad in accordance with the Always Delray plan, uh, wider sidewalks on Congress Avenue, and um, connections internally from all of the buildings, including the office, to all of the amenities so that it is integrated as one big master plan, and, and this is obviously part of the master plan. I won't go through all of this. Your staff also has um, a thorough analysis of goals, policies, and objectives that we're compliant with, and we included this within our presentation. Okay, so now to, to get to the changes. So after the April 18th meeting, um, we have not modified the first waiver, which um, ha has a maximum setback to Congress. All of these waivers are based on existing conditions. We are not doing anything with this approval to create any new waiver relief requests, nor are we exacerbating existing nonconformities. Again, it's over, this plan, these plans are over 40 years old. The buildings that exist today are over 40 years old. They were built under a different code. That code did not require any of the elements that we're asking for relief. The existing buildings today are legally nonconforming. And to do anything on that site that would trigger, that would be greater than the 25% code requirement as far as modifications, would require this plan, these buildings, to go through these waiver requests. Anyway, so as far as the front setback is concerned, and I'm going to get to a, 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 some a pictures that will better depict this, the existing buildings exceed the maximum 20-foot setback from Congress. So we're asking for relief for the existing buildings. The next one relates to parking adjacent to Congress. When the code changed, that was one of the things that was eliminated. <coughs> there is existing parking that is in front of the buildings that runs along Congress. We are actually reducing the amount of spaces, making the plan more compliant than it exists today. We've eliminated at least, well, 23 spaces plus what we eliminated in front of the residential building, and I'll go into that a little bit more de in depth um, in our graphic. So again, existing conditions that we are making more compliant, not fully compliant, but more compliant. A waiver regarding landscape islands and the size of landscape islands. We have 64 lands landscape islands, 55 of them are compliant. Um, we, we made three more from the last meeting compliant. So we are very, very close, but these are existing islands. We have taken existing islands and made them more compliant because there are a lot more non-compliant as, as there sits out there today. And then the next one is, um, let's see, I think I hit that one. Um, oh, buffers. So this property, uh, no buffer on this property complied with the code as it sits there today. The west is non-compliant, the north is non-compliant, the east is non-compliant, and the south is non-compliant. Different rules 40 years ago, different rules today. We have now made, since our last meeting, we've made the Congress buffer, the west, 100% compliant. So the entire Congress frontage buffer meets and exceeds the code. The north buffer, we have made 100% compliant so that the north buffer meet and exceeds the code. The south buffer is existing, and to make that compliant, we would lose parking, which would then create a problem as far as a different waiver request might be needed. And on the east buffer, we have the same problem. Um, I would also like to mention that the Always Delray Comp Plan requires um, canals and the railroad tracks to provide the pathways. Our pathway is in the buffer. We have, we don't get to count that as open space, but we, it is one of the allowable elements within the buffer, so it does not affect the buffer. But that east buffer, again, is existing. 
where the residential building is, our buffers are 100% compliant. But around the existing buildings, they are not. We have converted four non-compliant down to two non-compliant. And of the two non-compliant, the northwest corner portion of the buffer, we have made more compliant. So every single waiver request we are making here today, we are making them more compliant than the building, the way that this property sits today. So, and then again, the one that we are eliminating altogether is the open space. We are under 25%, we're now over it. Okay. So, the one we can't get rid of is without demolishing the buildings, and they're 95% occupied and huge investments have been made into them, um, relate to the front setback. As you can see, those are the existing building setbacks. The requirement is that they be 20, so it's impossible. It's not a condition we created. It's not one we can fix unless we knock down two viable economic forces in the city as they are 95% occupied. So um, I don't think that uh, th there was, I think, a point that came up about the possibility of moving the residential building forward. And uh, you may remember on one of the slides where I showed you those four parking spaces, providing circulation as we have not only connects the the, 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 it make, gives the pedestrian an easier and more understandable experience, but it also facilitates the improvements of the driveway openings, particularly the one at Germantown Road. And uh, Joaquin Vargas is here today. He's going to get into that more fully, so we'll come back to that. Um, also, moving that building forward, we would, we would reduce some of our pedestrian plaza area, our open space areas, which we believe is, is much more valuable there. Um, so we'll get into that in just a few minutes. The proposed setback is a little closer to the street, but it's consistent and compatible with the two buildings on each side of it, which was important. Access is more consistent. Circulation for vehicles is better. Palm Beach County has approved our traffic. Your city has looked at our driveways from an engineering perspective, and they're engineered appropriately and the site will function in a more unified manner instead of being um, cut into portions. Okay, so I'm, I think I'm gonna turn this over to you now, Joaquin, if you don't mind, and he's going to take the next few slides and I know you'll have some traffic questions, so. Hopefully not. <laughs> uh, for the record, uh, Mr. Chairman and board members, Joaquin Vargas with Traftech Engineering a traffic engineer for the project. I do have a couple of slides. I want to talk a little bit about the proposed use and, and why it's good from a traffic impact standpoint. I did mention a little bit about that last time. And I'm going to focus on the intersection of Germantown Road and Congress Avenue. I know that there were there was a lengthy discussion on that regarding the previous project. And then I'll, I'll end up with a slide talking about if we move the residential building further to the west, what are the traffic implications associated with that? You may recall that I did mention that the proposed use residential is a good use from a traffic impact standpoint for the following reason. Since we have office use in this, at this location, in the morning the office traffic is arriving to the site, so they are entering the site while the residential traffic is, is exiting the traffic, so they're not compounding one uh, uh, in addition to the other. And in the afternoon, it's the reverse. The office traffic is leaving while the residential traffic is entering. That is important, especially from a queuing standpoint. We do have some limitations on the turn lanes on Congress Avenue, so because they're not added together, it, it does help with the queuing associated with access uh, on, on this site. What do you press to? Right. Um, this slide, I'm going to talk about the, the uh, Germantown Road, Congress Avenue intersection. Um, and I'll point out that we did work very closely uh, with Palm Beach County. They asked us to evaluate this with two different methodologies, which we did. 
we had to include traffic associated with approved developments, the project that was here before us. All that traffic was included in the analysis uh, as well. On this slide, you, you'll see on the left side is, is, uh, is a photograph uh, of this is the exit from the site. Uh, the point of this slide is we currently have one exit lane and one entrance lane. This is the main entrance which aligns with Germantown Road, which has a traffic signal, which is beneficial from a safety standpoint because we have a traffic signal to control all the different movements. On the right side of the screen, uh, you see the proposal. So we're adding an additional lane exiting the site, which is a good thing. You may ask, well, you're adding more traffic, therefore you have to add an additional lane. But if you remember the previous comment, traffic is not added. So in the morning, the residential traffic is leaving and we're adding an additional lane while the office traffic is entering and in the afternoon is the reverse. So that, that is a positive. In addition to that, you'll see that towards the right side, once you enter the site, there is a connection. Currently, there is no connection between the two office parcels. Uh, it is a good practice to have interconnectivity. Traffic will have access to the, to the different access points. They can take advantage of the signalized intersection. And what happens in the real world is that traffic optimizes itself when you have multiple options to enter and exit if you do have that internal connectivity. Uh, connectivity. This next slide, uh, and this was working very closely with, with Palm Beach County, you'll see the, the photo on the left shows, and Bonnie mentioned a little bit about that, within 40 feet of that signalized intersection we have parking spaces. So if there's very short distance, if a car is, is parking or unparking, it may affect entering traffic, but especially the exiting traffic is being affected with that. If you look at the photo to the right, we have about 90 feet before the, the first uh, uh, parking space is encountered. So we, we, we're, we're improving that, that conflict point. And the connectivity with the site to the north, there is no parking space. If you looked on the right side of the screen, there is no, no immediate parking spaces uh, in that area. This uh, last slide, um, I was asked, if it, what happens if we move the residential building further west, closer to Congress Avenue? The, you may have heard the terminology, the throat distance, and that is the distance when you have a traffic signal, the distance between the roadway and the first conflict point. We want to maximize that. And, and if we move the building further to the west, then that throat dimension becomes too narrow to have a fully operational signal from, from the east side of the roadway. So that driveway, you'll see those green arrows, that driveway would have to be restricted to right turns in and right turns out. And then what does that cause us? You'll see that there's a, a red line. I know it's a little bit hard to read, but traffic that wants to go towards Germantown Road or wants to go south on Congress Avenue, some will make a right-hand turn and then make that U-turn to go back south. That immediately to the north turn lane is very short. It provides access to a residential development that's on the west side. And the additional traffic from this development, if that movement is restricted, would, would, would not be accommodated on that left turn lane, and it cannot be lengthened any further, which will cause traffic to stop on the through lane, which is, which is a safety hazard. The alternative is the blue lines, is for, for traffic to use that northern entrance. And I know that there was a, a board member that mentioned uh, the issue with the previous development, crossing six lanes of traffic on Congress Avenue. It certainly is, it's, it's an allowable movement in many cases, but, but it's not that convenient when you don't have a traffic signal. What that causes is traffic to have to wait longer periods of time to be able to find a break in traffic to make that movement. Traffic backs up and, and we all drive. We've all experienced this when you have to wait a long time to make a movement. Tr drivers then tend to take uh, unnecessary risk to try to make those movements, making it, making it safe. So in closure, the, we have evaluated uh, a very detailed analysis of Germantown Road and, and our project driveway. We are making those improvements, increasing the first conflict point, adding an additional a second exit lane. And as I mentioned, it, the traffic does not add one on top of the other. So that is a benefit to that intersection. The cross axis is going to be beneficial. And again, by moving that residential building further to the west, 
will then convert this driveway to right in, right out, which will then create some additional traffic problems. That concludes my presentation. I'll be available for any further questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Vasquez. Okay, so uh, again, one of the waivers um, limits parking adjacent to Congress. We have reduced the amount of parking adjacent to Congress in front of the residential. There were approximately 27 spaces previously, and now we have about 11. So we've gotten rid of half of the parking that was between what would have been a building and the street. On the northwest corner, we've eliminated um, a number of spaces over there, eight, and we've actually shortened some other ones so that we can increase the buffer. Um, why can't we eradicate that parking altogether? Well, the first thing is we have two existing buildings that are 95% occupied with Class A and Class B tenants who have leases, and their leases specify the amount of parking that there is and where the parking is, and so we can't just ignore the contracts that are currently pending and applicable. Also, having the through traffic that we have provides an improved um, methodology for pedestrian connectivity, um, and it's very consistent. It runs along the buildings. It keeps the people a little closer to where they're going, particularly in heat and rain. And then um, the new mixed-use structure is just more compatible because it's in line with the existing buildings that are already there. The, all right. I don't know. If, okay, so this um, graphic just shows you the sea of parking that is out there today. The yellow area it goes away. Now, one of the other, when MROC was originally under discussion, um, the goal was to push the buildings up closer to the street so the parking would be behind it. Uh, some of the buildings on Congress have done that, most have not because they were designed under a different code. But um, this particular project with the two different parcels had a lot of parking that was entirely visible from the street. Your, that large yellow area is that. On the northwest corner, we got rid of a good portion of that parking, so it's now green space and plaza space. And the other, we shortened it so we could have more of a buffer. Again, the buffer is fully compliant. So this is our landscape island waiver discussion. And just for your benefit, 60, I mentioned to you 64 islands. Um, nine are not compliant today, um, and the rest are compliant. Since the last meeting, we have made uh, expanded three of the buffers to make them compliant. So they're existing islands. They are around the existing buildings. We are not making it worse. We're making it better. And the islands that are around the new building are fully compliant. But the majority of the islands here are compliant because of changes that were made by the design team. Buffer widths. The, if you look at the upper screen, um, well, let, let's start with the lower screen. We had submitted um, this plan that had a very small amount on the northwest corner of buffer that we could not do anything with. They were existing conditions. They were in front of an existing office building. On the north side, existing con conditions. On the north side of the existing building, on the north east side of the site, existing conditions also shown in red, and on the southern part, existing conditions shown in red. We have eliminated any nonconformities on the north side, all nonconformities on the east side, so that we have made serious improvements to the noncompliance. And um, what, what is left, we, we actually even increase the buffer size on the northeast corner, as you can see, it's a little wider as far as um, what we're showing as, well, you, you really can't tell because they're not quite in scale, but the, it is a wider buffer than when we presented in April. I won't go into each of the elevations. If you have questions, we can come back to them. The elevations have not changed since you last saw us. Um, so 
I just wanted to talk a little bit because there were some comments made about the problem. You know, I think there was a shoehorn comment and trying to introduce and integrate the residential onto the site and how that created a problem. And I wanted to speak to you a little bit, and I've handed out a couple of things that we'll talk about. But let me get to my last slide here. So um, CBRE uh, and Jeff Kelly uh, are the um, brokers and the agent that, that is working with this particular property owner and has been working with them and actually does significant amount of work in Palm Beach County and South Palm Beach County in particular. And they did a little market analysis of this, um, this site, this office, how Delray is doing from an office perspective. And so I had handed uh, out, and I hope it, you received them um, in your email, Mr. Kelly's letter. He's here to talk about it in the event. Ms. Meskel, yes, I, I just want to state I, I received no correspondence from your office within the past week or so. So if you okay. think something was sent, I don't know about my colleagues here on the board, but I can tell you it was not forwarded to the it was not sent to us. Yeah, well, it, it was submitted to the city, but we'll go over it, so I think it's fine, if you don't mind. I just wanted yeah. you to know. Thank you very much, I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. So, so Mr. Kelly and his team looked at um, the Delray Beach market, and they did an overview, and as I mentioned before, 1615 and 1625 are 95% leased, um, with both small and larger office tenants, the larger office tenants occupying as much as a floor. Uh, 21,000 to 26,000 rentable square feet. Um, the lease terms vary depending upon the tenant uh, with the longest lease expiring in 2032. So there are some years ahead of this um, for tenants in, this existing, in the existing bu buildings. But current market conditions based upon first quarter CBRE Palm Beach County office market overview, Delray Beach consists of, and this is Delray Beach proper, this is the city limits. Um, consist of a total of 90,700 square feet of Class A office space and 284,475 square feet of Class B office space for a total of 375,175 square feet for the market. The subject property is considered Class B and, and the majority of the Class B space in the city. Broken out by class types of the existing square footage, 34,000 square feet of Class A and 36,400 square feet of Class B space is currently available in the city of Delray Beach. So there isn't a lot of Class A and Class B available today. There are two new projects, one under construction, the other about to go under construction. Atlantic Crossing Building Number 1 offers 45,000 square feet of Class A office space, and it is already 100% leased. Um, building two, which is the second part of their office um, square footage, um, offers an equal amount but will not be available for two years. Uh, Sunday Village uh, was recently approved and um, is in the process of finalizing all their de details so that they can commence construction. They have approximately 90,900 square feet Class A office space. They have experienced significant interest and they expect to be fully leased out by the time a certificate of occupancy is ready to be issued. So as far as what is available for future tenants in the city of Delray, pretty much nothing. Um, what you have is, full, is nearly full. And Mr. Kelly is going to speak, I think, a little later, so you can certainly ask him any questions. Um, I also gave you a handout just a few minutes ago, and I'd like to explain what it is, because it also talks about the market. And the reason I'm going through this is whether there really is an opportunity to knock Ms. down. Ms. Meskel, I just want to say we haven't been given anything by you today. I just handed, oh, please, oh, I'm sorry. Frank is my Vanna today. I, there are two handouts. Thank no you. Problem. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of them um, provides populations of, for cities within Palm Beach County. And just to summarize this, West Palm Beach sits at the largest city at 107. And these are, by the way, for the most part, are based on 2020 data. West Palm is one of the largest, 117,000 square feet. Uh, pardon me, people. <laughs> Uh, Boca is the second, 97,000. Boynton third at eight, a little over 80,000. 
Delray is number four at 66, 846. And again, that was based on 2020 information. Given uh, post-pandemic and the number of people moving into this uh, county and, and these cities, I'm sure those numbers are greater today than they were in 2020. Um, the, the, and, and so that, just keep those numbers in mind. Um, and then the next sheet talks about the total square footage of inventory for office in Palm Beach County, which Palm, these are, are again based on Palm Beach County information. 44,500,000 square feet of inventory. And then the different markets are listed beneath that. Um, the number one market happens to be the city of Boca Raton with a combined, and, and by the way, they break it out into sections, but essentially um, those sections of the city of Boca amount to about 16,300,000 of the 44.5 million. West Palm Beach is, is second, and they break theirs out into two with their, their CBD and their non-CBD properties, but they're at a little over 10 million. Um, North Palm, which is really Palm Beach Gardens, 6 million five. Uh, Jupiter, 2 million eight. And then Delray, 2 million three. Now, the, de these markets go beyond city limits. Obviously, we just told you what Delray's market was at around 375,000. That is well outside the city limits. It also inc includes unincorporated, and it can go as far west as Drug Road. So my point is that the other cities are outpacing Delray that are comparable to them in office, and hence a bu two buildings that have, and, and my client will talk at the end, significant investments significant tenants, larger tenants, and that are 95% occupied are very important to the city, particularly since the 180,000 square feet plus or minus is the majority of the space that is in the city. So please just keep that in mind. And I just wanted to emphasize that because there was some discussion about that at the last meeting. And so I think, um, you know, in, in Mr. Kelly's letter, they talk about the effect of eliminating that square footage. There isn't other office square footage for those tenants to go to should this particular owner decide that they want to just wipe the slate clean and start from scratch, which would have been easier for sure because you could have designed exactly what you needed and what you wanted and it could have been fully compliant. But losing that 180,000 square feet would go somewhere else. And the bulk of the inventory is our neighbor to the south. So that is an important um, office community for the city of Delray Beach. Um, and I think, oh, and, and finally, Boca has a bit of a competitive advantage in that Brightline Station is under construction. And it is drawing a lot of the tenants to the, to the city of Boca just for convenience and their, their ability to access well beyond their market as far as the train is concerned. So I think that is pretty much the end of our presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. We have a whole team of people here with us today from our architect to our traffic engineer to the clients <laughs> and to their support staff. So thank you very much for your patience and we wanted to make sure that you understood fully what we've done since the last meeting. Thank you, Ms. Mistel. Ms. Issa. <laughs> Thank you. Amy's gone to print those out for you. They were emailed to me. I thought that you guys were going to get them, so I apologize about that. Um, she'll get you that letter shortly. Thank you. Okay, again, for the record, I'm Elizabeth Issa, Senior Planner with the Development Services Department, presenting the Delray Central Master Development Plan petition to you this evening. Um, I'm not going to go into a full presentation, but I will give you a brief um, just summary or reminder that the two subject properties um, consisting of approximately 12.134 acres are generally located at the southeast corner of West Linton Boulevard and South Congress Avenue at the southern terminus of Old Germantown Road. They are zoned mixed-use residential office and commercial, um, which we call MROC, with a land use 
uh, category of uh, Congress Avenue Mixed Use CMU. The northern property, which consists of 7.19 acres, is located at 1615 South Congress Avenue and contains an approximately 80,580 square foot two-story office building and associated parking. Uh, southern property consists of 4.94 acres and it's located at 1625 South Congress Avenue and contains an approximately 101,000 square foot four-story office building and associated parking. Both buildings were constructed in the early 1980s, um, are leased, and contain active uses. So as a reminder, the, applic the, the applicant is proposing a master development plan, which accommodates the two existing office buildings and incorporates the following site modifications and improvements. Uh, the removal of, this is probably inaccurate, I don't know that I updated, the removal of 232 parking spaces, I might need to, to correct that. Um, construction of a new building to include an eight-story, uh, 271 residential unit, multifamily, uh, building uh, with 1,095 square feet of non-restaurant commercial space on the ground floor and a seven-level parking garage, um, which was previously proposed with 505 spaces and now is 513 spaces since the last meeting. Um, and uh, 55 of the 271 units are proposed as workforce housing units. That is 20% of the total units, and they are being proposed at the, aver at the moderate average median income uh, level for Palm Beach County, proportionately distributed throughout the unit types as floater units. Residential amenities include a gym and yoga space, central courtyard area with swimming pool, tot lot, bike, storage room, a co-working conference room, an on-site leasing office. Multiple pocket parks are proposed along South Congress Avenue that include enhanced landscaping and seating areas in addition to a 1,450 foot long linear section of shared juice path along the rear of the property. The new buildings will be centrally located to the property between the two office buildings. The two parcels which are currently operating independent of one another will be unified as one development and their respective access drives will be interconnected. Access to all of the elements of the master development plan is pro provided um, off of South Congress Avenue. Okay, on April 18th, 2022, the Planning and Zoning Board considered this subject request and voted five to one to continue with direction. Uh, Christina Morrison was absent. Alan Zeller was dis the dissenting vote. Um, during the board's consideration and discussion of the item, concerns were expressed regarding the request of waivers to memorialize nonconformities instead of bringing the site into compliance, excess parking provided in lieu of providing additional landscaping, overall size and scale of the project and location on the subject site, and a lack of mix of unit types, income levels, and income levels for units reserved as workforce housing. Okay, so this is a lot of text. Um, this are the changes that the applicant has uh, provided since the last meeting. Um, Ms. Miskell did a very good job of going over those changes. So they removed nine parking spaces on the northwest corner, which allowed them to increase the buffer um, and open space area. Uh, they increased the size of the main pocket park at the um, kind of the entrance of the residential building. Um, which would make the west buffer a uh, hundred i'm sorry the, the, and the, and then they they, they increased the the west buffer which is now 100 percent compliant um they they increased the north buffer and it is now also 100 percent compliant um the east buffer they they uh they provided an additional approximately 18 feet of buffer area on that side um, the parking lot to the south of the 1625 building removed unnecessary impervious sidewalk so that they could increase overall open space and make three additional landscape islands compliant. Addition, uh, they provided pavers in the front of the residential building to enhance the entrance and improve the South Congress Avenue frontage. Um, modification to the parking calculation for the office buildings based on the provided net square footage as opposed to the gross square footage. Um, in doing so, they eliminated 12 parking space based on a total of 3,340 square feet between the two existing office buildings. And then some additional modifications to the site data chart um, that just needed to be corrected. So um, as you're aware, the applicant is requesting um, some waivers as part of the master development plan request. Um, the first waiver 
is related to um, the front setback, which is required or is allowed to be a maximum of 20 feet, uh, and they're proposing 90 feet, 10 inches. There was no change to that waiver request. Uh, the next waiver was to maintain certain landscape islands at less than nine feet uh, width in lieu of providing the nine foot width landscape island at an interval of every 13 spaces. Um, so adjustments were made to make three it's either two or three. It's like two if you consider a double one um, as two. Um, but basically, um, we'll, we'll call it three, um, leaving eight um, non-conforming non landscape islands. Um, the, um, the next waiver is a waiver to provide landscape buffers less than 15 feet in lieu of providing the required 15 feet. Um, along the north, west, and south property line and provi providing a 25-foot landscape buffer um, in the rear adjacent to the CSX F FEC railway. Uh, the chart up on the screen shows you um, what is proposed now that the north buffer complies, um, the north and west buffer complies. Um, there was no change to the south buffer and um, the east buffer was modified to provide um, an additional 10% area. Um, and then the next waiver was to allow parking adjacent to Congress Avenue. The applicant further reduced the amount of parking spaces located adjacent to Congress um, by an additional eight spaces from the board's initial review for a total of 23 spaces eliminated from those that exist. The, um, so this adjustment further reduces the existing nonconformity. And the waiver re related to open space was eliminated. They were previously providing 24.4% open space. Um, and with the addition of some of the landscape areas, they were able to bring that up to 25.11%. So that waiver has been removed. Okay, section 2.4.5 F1, which is the site and master development plan um, requirements specifies that a master development plan is required for properties within certain zoning districts or for projects which are phased. Um, in addition, LDR section 2.4.5 F4 allows that conditions may be imposed by the appropriate board for master development plans in accordance with another code provision. Um, the section provides that granting approval to any development application, uh, the granting body may impose whatever conditions it deems necessary in order to ensure that the compatibility of the use with nearby existing and proposed uses um, occurs concurrency, consistency with objectives and policies of the comprehensive plan, the fulfillment of these regulations which should have or could have been fulfilled provide I'm sorry, fulfilled prior to the approval action, but which were not due to conditions beyond the control of the applicant, and that the fulfillment of these requirements, which could have been fulfilled prior but remain outstanding, thus providing that they will be accommodated in a later, later stage of processing. Um, so in consideration of the request, staff has specified areas where the board may want to consider requiring revisions to the proposal or including specific conditions to better meet the intent of the code. Moving, okay, so moving, going back, I guess you could say, to the waivers, um, the required findings in section 2.4.6 F6C um, requires that the board, uh, concurrent with the approval of the master development plan, um, makes, I'm sorry, allow, allows the board to um, grant waivers in uh, while they're approving the master development plan. And then section 2.4.7 B5 provides the findings that need to be made in order to grant those waivers. And the findings are that the waiver shall not adversely affect the neighboring area. They shall not significantly division diminish the provision of public facilities, they shall not create an unsafe situation, and they do not result in the grant of a special privilege in the same way, in that the same way that waiver would be granted under similar circumstances on other property for another applicant or owner. So just to go back over the waivers one by one, uh, there's the front setback waiver. As I mentioned, this has not changed. They are asking for 90 feet, 10 inches, where a maximum of 20 feet um, is permitted. Um, the MROC zoning district strives to create a more urban, pedestrian-friendly, mixed-use corridor in contrast to the auto-centric suburban development type that remains. The intent of the maximum setback along South Congress Avenue is to provide a more engaging streetscape with buildings positioned closer to the street and vehicular areas located to the side and behind them. The proposed building aligns with the existing office buildings and has been placed to retain the drive aisle along the front of the property as well as the vehicular entrance at the intersection of Old, of Old Germantown Road. 
The board should consider whether the granting of the waiver allows for a reasonable site layout given the location of the existing buildings, intersection, and driveway access, which was constructed in the early 1980s, or providing the required front setback would better meet the vision of the corridor, even if the existing office buildings remained. Um, there is, uh, sorry, further, the board should consider whether the larger setback would have an adverse impact adverse effect on the neighboring area in the long term by not providing desired development patterns when the opportunity for significant new construction is presented. Um, as far as the landscape buffers, as I mentioned, they have um, come back with some um, improvements to the prior proposed landscape buffers, um, which are an existing nonconformity that is um, that they have proposed uh, to remain in the development. So. Um, the top is uh, the, per the currently proposed um, buffers, and the bottom is the previously submitted plan. So you can see that um, up, up in this corner, they were able to increase the buffer and um, yes, that's what they did. And I, I believe they, they added some additional area up here, too. Um, the, land, the applicant has designed a series of landscape pocket parks along the South Congress Avenue streetscape to provide beautification and to enhance the corridor. Uh, the board should consider whether the, this design offsets any potential long-term adver adverse effects on the surrounding area and if the design is sufficient to prevent the granting of a special privilege. As far as parking along Congress Avenue, the existing development has parking along South Congress Avenue. The previous proposal reduced the existing nonconformity by eliminating approximately eight parking spaces and providing additional green space and a pedestrian connection from the proposed building to the sidewalk. Um, as I mentioned, the applicant has removed an additional eight spaces along Congress Avenue since the last presentation to the board. Uh, there is excess parking provided, which presents an opportunity to eliminate additional parking spaces between the new building and South Congress Avenue, thereby further reducing the nonconformity and urban heat island effect while providing additional landscape buffer area and landscaping. Um, the board sh uh, should consider whether additional beautification, particularly along the South Congress Avenue streetscape, could be provided to further enhance the corridor and reduce the adverse effects of surface parking in front of the building. Finally, the landscape islands um, waiver. Uh, the parking lot conditions on the site have existed since the early 1980s. Uh, however, when more than 25% of existing gross square feet is proposed, the entire site is required to come into compliance with the city's landscaping provisions. As a result, it has been identified that the existing landscape islands do not meet the minimum size requirements. Um, the parking area around the islands will be restriped to come into compliance with respect to the current striping and parking space standards, and the applicant has identified that um, the existing islands maintain mature trees that will be maintained. Um, since the prior proposal, uh, nine additional islands were, um, I'm sorry, since the prior proposal, um, they were able to get three more uh, landscape islands um, to meet the code requirements and a total of eight islands remain non-conforming. And as I mentioned, the open space requirement has been eliminated. Okay, I just wanted to go to highlight a couple of topics um, for the board. Um, first being the allocation of uses. The MROC zoning district prescribes that the allocation of uses in a development, um, pre prescribes what the allocation of uses in a, in a development should be. LDR section 4429B4C, which um, talks about multifamily dwelling units, specifies that residential units greater than 2,500 feet from the tri-rail tri station may comprise up to 75% of the total floor area of the master development plan when part of a mixed-use development containing office and or commercial uses. The residential component comprises 46%. Um, the size of the unit types must meet the minimum requirements provided in the LDR, and um, that will, and then that, that site plan will be approved by the SPRAB board. Um, further, LDR section 4429I5 stipulates where residential use, uses are located in structures having frontage on Congress Avenue. Um, 
there must be non-residential uses fronting on Congress Avenue on the ground floor. The existing development provides office uses on 100% of the ground floors of both buildings with no residential units. The proposed building to be inserted between the offices provides 271 units with 1,095 square feet of commercial use, uh, non-restaurant non commercial use, and the residential amenities, including the gym and yoga space and um, the other amenities I mentioned previously. Um, the site layout provides a mix of uses, and it is important to note that the mixed-use development can be successful in either a vertical or horizontal mix arrangement. Um, one of the topics that was brought up at the last meeting is the calculation of gross square footage versus net square footage for existing office buildings for purposes of parking. Um, Pursuant to section 469C4A, business and professional offices shall provide four spaces, four spaces for uh, per thousand square feet um, up to the first 3,000, and then after that it's three, pa three spaces for every thousand square feet. And basically they're able to extract out um, common area type spaces. So ma major vertical penetrations of the floor, elevator, mechanical shafts, stairwells, um, that sort of thing, they can actually take that out of the overall square footage in order to calculate required parking. So this is basically just the definition of um, net square footage. So, um, okay, so the applicant, I think this is out of order. No, it's not. Um, well, okay. Sorry. Um, give me one second. The applicant was previously calculating the existing office buildings using gross square footage to calculate required parking. Staff had included a technical note to amend the parking tables to utilize net office square footage in the calculation of the parking requirements and also noted that the board should consider whether an adjustment to the parking calculation should be provided to reduce the amount of parking required and provided, provided resulting in a reduction in hardscaping and increasing in open space. Uh, using property appraiser data, the applicant determined and modified the square footage of the existing office building to indicate that 1615 South Congress Avenue, which contains 79,560 net square feet, uh, would, contained 79,560 net square feet versus 80,580 square feet of gross, which is a difference of 1,020 square feet for a two-story office building. And that 1625 South Congress Avenue contains 98,666 net square feet versus 101,006 gross square feet, which is a difference of 2,340 square feet for a four-story office building. The total difference is 3,360 net square feet between the two buildings. Um, so the amount of uh, the amount removed and assumed as net is minimal. It's roughly 2.3% of the 101,006 square foot four-story building and 1.5% of the 80,580 square foot two-story building. Um, construction plans for 1615 South Congress Avenue were located and indicate many areas that would qualify to be removed from the net square footage calculation, such as hallways, bathrooms, mechanical equipment areas, et cetera. Um, given the standard dimensions for door openings, hallway widths, et cetera, along with the provided dimensions that were on the plans, a professional estimation could be made that would be more realistic than the utilization of property appraiser information. Additionally, internet searches for the average amount of common area for an office building turn up several references for a common area factor at an average of 10 to 25 percent for office buildings. Using even the low end of the common area assumption would provide a much smaller net square footage for purposes of calculating required parking, which would result in the opportunity to provide additional landscaping and open space while also reducing the urban heat island effect. Um, if 10% were assumed to be the common area factor for the office buildings, which is on the low end of the typical amount, approximately 18,159 square feet could be removed from the office building's required parking calculations, which would equate to approximately 64 parking spaces. A parking space is required to be designed with dimensions of 9 feet by 18 feet, which equates to about 162 square feet. Assuming 162 square feet multiplied by 64 parking spaces, the project could potentially provide approximately 10,368 square feet of additional landscaping and open space in lieu of parking that is not required by code. <clears throat> this reduction in the amount of asphalt and increase in the amount of landscaping and open space would also have a, a more significantly positive envir environmental impact. 
Please note that the applicant has removed 12 required parking spaces based, up, based off of the calculation of a reduction of 3,360 square feet, which has allowed for 1,944 square feet of additional landscaping and open space. The board was also concerned about the lack of mix of affordable housing unit types. Um, section 4429B4C1 uh, requires that res residential developments must include a minimum of 20% workforce units consisting, consisting of moderate income workforce units as defined by Article 47 of our LDRs. The development, de the development does meet the minimum requirements by providing 20% of the total number of units proposed as workforce housing at the moderate income level. It should be noted that the LDR provides for the minimum required and do does not prohibit an applicant proposing additional workforce housing units or providing a mix, um, mix of income levels such as low or very low. Okay. Um, Prior to the approval of a development application, the project must also meet the, L the findings in LDR section 3.1.1. Um, there's an extensive analysis of, the, of, this, of these uh, requirements in your backup, um, so I, I'm not going to go over it again. Um, but the project does meet the, um, the four areas, land use map, concurrency, consistency, and compliance with the land development regulations. So to summarize some considerations um, that staff feels the board should um, consider, um, whether the provision of the 1,095, that says 1,085, it's 1,095 square feet of non-restaurant commercial space and amenities for the residential unit meets the intent of the requirement that there must be non-residential uses fronting on Congress Avenue on the ground floor, whether an adjustment to the parking calculation should be provided to reduce the amount of parking required and provided and provide I'm sorry, resulting in a reduction in hardscaping and an increase in open space, whether the inclusion of more open space is more appropriate to both meet the minimum MROC requirement of 25% and reduce landscape associated nonconformities, and whether the proposal meets the intent of the MROC district vision within the city um, and the needs of the residents. So I do have some um, board action options um, to move approval, to move approval as amended, to move with um, sorry, to move denial, or to continue with directions. Um, and before I finish, um, I just had to make a couple of corrections to the applicant's presentation. Um, just first that workforce housing is required throughout MROC. Um, the, the density and amount of the residential mix depends on the distance from tri-rail, but um, it is required throughout the district. And also Alta Del Rey um, provided 20%, which um, came out to 74 units of the 369. So just wanted to correct that for the record. But that does complete my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Ms. Issa. Really appreciate that. And now we can move into public comment. Is there any member of the public here this evening who would like to comment on this item? If there is, I would ask that you approach the podium on my right, on that side, and please state your name and uh, address for the record. And if I could just ask you, sir, excuse me, um, were you sworn? by the yes. board secretary? I was. Fine. Thank you, I just wanted to check. Uh, my name is Jeff Kelly, and I reside at 170 Southwest 6th Avenue in Boca Raton, Florida. Um, as uh, Ms. Miskell had mentioned earlier, I work for CBRE, I'm a commercial real estate office broker, have been for 36 years in the area, and uh, I represent the ownership of Delray Central, and I've been involved with those properties um, probably about 15 to 20 years, I can't remember exactly. So I've done the majority, if not all, the leasing in those two buildings. And uh, I'm just kind of piggybacking on why I do feel those buildings are an integral part and a significant part of the, uh, of the office market in, De in Delray Beach. Um, as you know, the ownership has done a phenomenal job of upgrading. Like I said, I've I dealt with previous owners on that property and, and the current group has done a great job investing in the property. Um, we have changed the tenant mix significantly where a number of years ago there was a number of call center, more back office operators, and we've uh, significantly changed it to corporate headquarters, engineering firms, uh, legal uh, law firms. So a, 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 you know, a more higher class of tenant, less parking needs, and uh, just overall better for the project, which has raised rents 
just this past week, we signed a 20,000 foot lease, uh, which took us up to the 95% occupancy. They're going to occupy a full floor in the uh, 1625 building. Uh, one of our tenants, a uh, Kimley Horn, a well-known national traffic engineer firm, just expanded and renewed their lease. So the activity's been really good. Uh, we're left with one space that's left in the 1615 building. Had a showing this past week with a group looking at it. So very vibrant, very active. Um, and I think it'd be a cry and shame if it was required to take those buildings down because, again, Delray does not have the office market, say, that Boca Raton does. And I think with the development of the residential actually enhances the office because you can just look to Boca to the south where I do a significant amount of work. And with them changing the zoning to allow uh, residential at 20 units per acre, it literally transformed the park at Broken Sound, which is an 850-acre mixed-use park five and a half million square feet of office space. We were hovering at vacancies in the 25 to 30 percent range um, right after, uh, you know, right while COVID hit and, you know, a lot of vacancy. The, the residential is capped at 2,500 units. It's been completely spoken for and I think it's close to 2,000 units are built or under construction. Our vacancies in that particular park are now at 11, 12 percent. So there's been a significant uh increase in occupancy and so i just see the same thing happens if you know with com you know the congress avenue corridor you know kind of combining those uses like the MROC reads i think is just a huge advantage for this uh, particular development and i think it's key that the office buildings remain in place so with that um thank you i can answer any questions or thank you very much thank you is there any member of the public um Yes, sir. Good evening. Uh, Keith O'Donnell, uh, 2518 Cocoa Plum, Boca Raton, Florida. Um, and I've been working in this market since Anina Pinta and Santa Maria were off the shore. <laughs> um, so actually, I did represent IBM when we came up here and expanded back in the 80s. And the only reason we didn't take where Minto developed the apartments across the street is um, we wanted to have apartments in those days. Now, as you know, IBM retrenched up to Raleigh, Durham, uh, and Austin, Texas, and then, then came Office Depot. And um, Office Depot continued to grow, as you know, and so we relocated Office Depot down to Boca Raton. And if you want to see what MROC was based on, drive down to Congress Avenue in Boca Raton. There is a couple of buildings called N uh, North 40, exactly like these buildings, were designed by Smallwood Reynolds out of Atlanta and built for IBM, and now there's 85-foot um, tall Class A multifamily. Um, so I sponsored that zoning, the PMD zoning. Years ago, I was asked by the planning directors in Delray Beach, should we do 100, 125 feet? And part of my recommendation was just to copy that 85-foot height. There was no reason to go any further than that. So I think that's, I'm not, not saying that's why it became it, but I, I didn't think 100 feet was appropriate along the corridor, and I thought that if you just sort of model, so if you look at what happened where Office Depot is, it's 85 feet tall, um, and adjacent to it is Whole Foods, and adjacent to that is uh, uh, 360 apartments. So what you have is you do have the ability to recruit and retain. You know, I mean, Jeff does a great job. I, I was with Jeff in the 1980s <laughs> down at CB. Um, and he does a great job of leasing, and, and, and well, Grover Corley are terrific owners. You're lucky to have them in, in Delray Beach, um, and, and they are the real deal. And, and enable, when, you're, when you're recruiting and retaining workforce, you've got to have a place for them to live uh, and not travel significant distances. So um, I would tell you that going back historically, IBM brought Minto in to do that apartment complex. Uh, off of Germantown Road, um, having, and I'm on the task force, I was on the task force, the mayor's task force, uh, that we did that report. Um, I'm also on the Delray Chamber uh, Board of Directors, and I'm the chair of the Economic Development Committee. So if you put all that together, I th strongly support this, um, because really you want to, what you want to do, if you can't make special places, because this is a, an active road with a batch plant, you got to make special spaces in a design. You got one of the best architects, and one of the and having that design and having that will create a special space. So I think that's really important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. 
Is fenced? Is fenced? Um, yes. Um, you're listing 271 residential units. Yes, ma'am. And you figure there's probably two people living in a unit at least. So are we talking like over 500 cars to be parked on this property? Well, the parking's been gone over, but probably close to that number. And I'm just wondering, you know, they have friends visiting, and I, I'm just wondering if you have enough space for parking on this property. I think, I think they have plenty of parking here. That's, I don't think that's a concern of anybody here this evening, but. There's a new garage being They built. have, they're gonna build a seven-story parking garage behind the apartment building. And how is that all going to look on South Congress Avenue? <laughs> well, that's what we're here to discuss. <laughs> yes, please, a little more discussion. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Benst. <laughs> yes, sir. Good evening. I'm Mike Kaufman. I reside at 2494 South Ocean Boulevard in Boca Raton. Uh, and I work at 3185 South Congress Ave. Um, just south of the proposed project. I'm the chair and CEO of Kaufman Lynn Construction, uh, and my wife and I were the developers, and we currently own the Kaufman Lynn headquarters building. Uh, when we chose to move to Delray after having our business in Boca Raton for just about 28 years, we did so with the excitement of the Congress Avenue Carter. It was uh, some new territory in, uh, in our local hometown, so we were excited about it. Um, and um, we felt like we were helping uh, the city uh, create some traction on South Congress, and in fact, I think we have, uh, and we love residing there. Our company is thriving. Um, our employees love being occupied in the building, uh, but they're challenged with housing. Um, we have 225 employees, and that moves up and down from week to week. They're owners of the company. Their average salaries uh, are well over $100,000. And none of them live within walking, biking, or three-mile radius. Uh, they cannot find suitable housing. The demand is just too high. Uh, so this project would certainly represent relief to that, uh, would give our uh, employees a, a much shorter commute, uh, much better living. Uh, Another factor for us is we recruit nationally. It's our national headquarters. We build around the country. Um, and as you know, it's a, there's a war out there on talent. So we're actively recruiting, na recruiting nationally. And in the last two years, we've lost dozens of recruits because of housing shortage. We can get them right to the finish line, agree on salary and compensation, and, and uh, we introduce them to the culture and can't get them there. Um, and one other a tidbit of information. We moved into our building on October, October 25th in 2017, the day after we got CO, as you might imagine. The first meeting I hosted in that building uh, on moving boxes, we didn't receive our furniture yet, uh, was with our friends at 13th floor. They came up to Delray because they heard of the proposed project and we encourage them to pursue that project, which is now known as Parks at Del Rey. Um, they're great folks, too. Uh, Grover Corla was a great developer. I need to mention we have absolutely no vested financial interest in this project as uh, on a development side or a construction side. We're just here um, to respectfully request your positive vote tonight for a great project. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kaufman. I was up earlier, Scott O'Donnell, 1850 Lake Drive, Delray Beach. Um, at the risk of being redundant, I too have uh, experienced uh, situations where my kids could not find affordable housing in the local area, apartments specifically. I have three between 22 and 28. Also, uh, I'm with Cushman Wakefield. We have a fairly sizable uh, presence here in South Florida. When I first came down here uh, 20 plus years ago, there were many 
young people who were living in apartments that they could afford throughout Delray and, and Boca Raton. Uh, today, none of the younger people within our office can afford to live in the immediate area. Apartment costs are just way too high. Um, the administrative assistants that are within our office, they're halfway up the, uh, the county to get to affordable housing. In fact, we just lost our uh, brokerage coordinator because she uh, got the opportunity uh, to work from home. She was tired of commuting all the way down from the north. Um, and so I can just vouch for uh, what you've heard earlier, and that is that housing prices, apartments are just out of reach, and we need more supply uh, for the younger people in this area. Thank you, sir. Hi, good evening. My name is Steve Mackey, 501 Northwest 7th Street, Delray Beach, Florida. I own some properties at the north end of this corridor. I have been on multiple corridor development teams. I am a Urban Land Institute active member. I have been advocating for development along the corridor for well over 15 years. I have always seen it as the release valve for the development that always happened downtown. I was also a planning and zoning uh, member for a number of years as well. Um, and I always advocated for it out there because uh, I was on this board when uh, IPIC was coming through and there was just so much intense heat and pressure downtown Del Rey. And I'm like, why don't we come out to the Congress Avenue corridor, um, you know, to relieve some of that pressure. You know, fast forward a number of years now, and we have in front of us a, a, a wonderful project here, um, mixed use in the sense that you have residential right next to office. Um, I consider, uh, you know, that end of the corridor, the southern end of it, I'm at the northern end, and then we have the middle at the Atlantic and Congress intersection. I envision those as the three main nodes of the corridor. I hope to see more residents out there, more office space out there, you know, more industrial space out there. And it's always been a part of our vision, everybody involved for like literally 15 years. Um, you know, to speak about the housing crisis, it's in Delray. Everybody wants to be here. There's no land left. We need more housing units. It's in Palm Beach County, the housing crisis. It's in South Florida, and it's a national housing crisis. We need more units. That's the easiest way to reduce the cost of housing is to create more supply. Um, so that's a no-brainer. And I was just reading there, our President Biden is releasing some new housing crisis plan like just today. So this is something that every community is dealing with. We need more housing supply. Please support this project. Please support all development any development out on the corridor. Thank you, Mr. Mackey. Yes, sir. Should I read the room and quit talking, or? <laughs> <laughs> My name's Paul Burrell. I live at 5301 Godfrey Road, Parkland, Florida. I need the zip code. Uh, I'm actually an owner of properties here in Delray. I own the 220 building the 190 building, the 200 building, and I just bought a piece of land. I'm in that middle corridor of, uh, on Congress Avenue right there. And um, I'm, I'm just out here to support the, the whole concept of this work, live and play, you know, on this street. Um, I bought here, um, first of all, you guys, you know, you've done a great job in Delray. A lot of people want to live here. Um, a lot of people want to work here, and a lot of people want to play here. And uh, that's what you're trying to accomplish, and I think we should try to accomplish that. The biggest crisis we have with my tenants that I, uh, I talk to every day is that there isn't a lot of housing. Um, I have an apartment complex right next to me, but they'd like to see more. And um, reality is, is that it's tough, whoever was saying it's, you know, it's a war out there for talent, and that's what we need. We need, you know, I, the the middle talent to have places to live um, because they want to they want to be here because it's a lot of fun it's a great city and uh, we just need the uh, 
more housing that would accommodate those those folks. So I'm I'm here to support, you know, these mixed use projects. Um, unfortunately, you're going to take stuff that's already existing. It's a tough battle, um, it, you know, as you guys can see with all the waivers. But you're dealing with existing facilities that need to that you hopefully can bring a housing component to or other kind of mixed use components. And it's a challenge, but I think uh, they've done a great job. And uh, I would encourage all of y'all to support it so as a city you can continue to grow and have places that people can live. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good evening. I'll keep it short. Everyone's done a tremendous job. I'm also here to advocate for a Class A developer. Can I have your name and can I have your oh, name and address for the record? I forgot that part. Pete Crane, two three one Northeast Fourteenth Street here in Delray Beach. Happen to be an Urban Land Institute member as well. I'm in commercial real estate developing projects around the country. Live, work, play can never be more important than it is today. The attraction of talent, the ability to attract businesses to work here. And I think Steve said it best. It's not a Delray crisis. It's not a state of Florida crisis. It's a national crisis on the ability to find affordable housing. And it's really the workforce. Now, there's $950 million worth of construction going on from every major hotel in downtown Delray. And you just listen to people complain about the traffic and the congestion. And I was always told that there was going to be an emphasis on the Congress corridor to ease that and to attract I mean, everything from the saltwater brewery that moved out there to the entire corridor needs to be looked at. Industrial office, and most importantly, this workforce housing. And if it's not, it, you're just going to continue to have the same problems over and over again. And there's only so much space in downtown Delray. And that's not where a lot of people need to move. You need to be able to spread it out a little bit. So as a developer in town uh, with no vested interest in this project, um, knowing the Grover Coralou guys pretty well, that's as good as it's going to get, and the project's going to be Class A. So I would advocate for this approval. Um, it, it's, it's just one of the ways that we can help Delray Beach continue to expand. Thanks. Thank you. That's it. That's it. <laughs> okay. Going once. Going twice, going three times, public comment is closed. <laughs> Ms. Issa, Ms. Miskell, do you have any rebuttal or cross-examination? I don't have cross-examination. I just have some, a, a bit of rebuttal. Please. Uh, we, we started this many, many moons ago, and you, I think Beth may be our, at least our second planner, if not third. Yeah, um, tag, you're it. Uh, we started with Kent. And one of the first things that we did is we looked at the corridor. What's out there? What's been approved? What hasn't been approved? How did others do what we were trying to do or a version of it? And Kent, and, and I just want to clarify some points. I asked Kent, how did Altus first become a freestanding residential? And where's the workforce agreement associated with it? His response was, there isn't one. There didn't need to be because it was within 1,000. Of course, being a lawyer, I went to the code, and I want to read the code for you because I want to clarify something um, because no, no mistake was made. So under 4.4.29B, which is the list of permitted uses in the MROC, 4, which is residential, which is a permitted use, it reads, multifamily uses excluding duplexes subject to C1234 with a maximum density of either 40 or 50, subject to the following, and it lists out the distances and percentage of total floor area, et cetera, et cetera. And it isn't until you get to C um, that it, it actually references the workforce. So is it artfully written? Probably not. Is it confusing? Absolutely. It's confusing to planners that have been here and read it. It's confusing to us. But the one, two, three, and four, which speaks to the nature of the workforce, is under C. And C, the title of C, is residential units at a distance greater than 2,500. So as somebody that's drafted for both the public and private sector, one, two, three, and four belong under 2,500. Now, I know you have a proposed code. 
um, in moving through the process that may be something that you, if it hasn't been clarified in this draft, that it is clarified in the draft because the way it's reading today, it does not apply the way Beth said it. And I think Kent was equally confused about it, as were we, because we asked the question. So I don't know how you want to interpret it. I am interpreted, interpreting it as it's written, but it may be something you want to correct. In any event, we are here today. We are The residential part of this project is fully compliant with the buffers. The only thing that it is not compliant with is that it is set back 90 feet, and there is some parking in front of it, not what was previously there. But we have taken a non-conforming project, and we have made it as conforming as possible. We've eradicated about 50% of the non-conformities. We hope that that's enough. We do not have the ability to move the office buildings. Thank you very much. I thank all of the public for participating this evening. We've had nothing but um, a, a, a welcoming from our neighbors and from the people that we've spoken to to date. And we are, we're excited about this project and hope you will be as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Miskell. Zisa? I don't have any rebuttal. <laughs> or cross-examination <laughs> or comments or anything else. Fine, thank you. With that point, we'll move it into board discussion. Ms. Blankenship. <laughs> thank you. Um, when this came before us last month, and uh, the majority of the board, um, with the exception of Ms. Morrison, who uh, made the motion to continue with direction and allowed this item to go back to the table because there was an extensive um, comments made at that time. And um, it's my opinion that uh, each board member up here um, shared their concerns and articulated their concerns. And so we wanted to give the applicant the opportunity to go back to the table um, and speak with staff and, and kind of see where we could get, and, and especially as they related to the concerns um, uh, as presented by the board. So imagine my surprise when I see it on this agenda, because there was no date certain, no drop dead date, nothing like that given, um, and here it is. And I thought, well, you know, this is gonna be interesting. And I have to say that when I read the staff report, I was somewhat um, disenchanted and uh, disappointed by what I read, because I don't think that we quite got there. And I think that uh, the intent of um, what was articulated from my colleagues was missed. Ms. Issa, could you put back up the slide that um, was about the April 18th meeting and the comments from the board at that time? <laughs> what I heard um, here tonight, why Ms. Issa's looking that up, why, what I heard here tonight was a lot of discussion about the existing office space and office space in Delray Beach or Boca Raton, which by the way, we are not trying to be Boca Raton or Delray Beach. Um, with that being said, uh, we're here really primarily to discuss the residential component that's being shoehorned in between those two existing office buildings, which I'm happy that they're um, fully, you know, primarily leased all the way and everything, that's great. And I, I'm happy about that. but. Really, I believe that what is most important here is the new residential building that will be constructed on that site, which is why we're here with this master development plan to begin with. Um, and you can see from the slide up on the screen that a lot of emphasis was, was placed upon uh, income levels and afford workforce housing. While you may meet the code, we did you know, quite openly discuss um, the needs of the city. Uh, the waivers are an issue. So instead of trying to bring them more you know, into compliance, you're kind of codifying what is already a, a non-compliance, you know, non-conformity. It may be a legal non-conformity because the buildings are old and I understand that, but we're also interject, you know, in putting in that place an office building, or I mean a residential development that's eight stories tall. By, by your right, you can build to that. But there has to be some consideration for what was discussed here. And waivers aren't necessarily just, okay, well, you have a master development plan. You have, a, what, six or seven waivers at the very beginning. We're just going to say, okay, you know, you know th that's a special privilege in my view. So, I mean, I'm not going to belabor it. It's a quarter to 10 at night, so I'll, I will wrap up my comments um, and allow my colleagues a chance to speak. And I will just say, it's my opinion that the master development plan and the associated waivers as outlined in the staff report are not consistent with the objectives and policies of the comprehensive plan in the city of Delray Beach. Specifically, I cannot make positive findings relating to LDR section 3.1.1C. Um, 
or the waiver section, LDR section 2.4.7 B5, subsections A and D, adversely affecting the neighborhood area and granting a special privilege. Um, and so for that reason, I will not be able to support the, the project this evening. Thank you. <sighs> Next. I, I have a Ms. Ms. Howell. Um, I'm, I'm curious, I heard you talk about the building being set back 90 feet. We had discussed at our meeting that we were not thrilled with that because of the Congress Avenue study, and while it wasn't adopted by the commission, it was accepted. Clearly, the vision of the staff and the commissioners seems to be quite different from what you've presented here. And I heard you talk earlier um, about the traffic flow and all of that. But it's my personal view that traffic planners are, are hired to, after the building has met other standards. And it, this seems like the tail wagging the dog. If the reason that you've set it back 90 feet is to accommodate the traffic flow, I just would question whether or not you couldn't bring it forward to comply more with the vision of a vibrant Congress Avenue and still be able to design traffic flow that would meet your needs. So one of the criteria for the waiver, and, and thank you, by the way, I'm happy to answer that question. One of the criteria talks about you can't create an unsafe condition. And today, there are unsafe conditions. The way that two driveways operate, both ingress and egress driveways, they're designed in a worse condition. One has parking that backs out into the driveway that is the main entrance on Germantown. The other has no traffic light, so you either have people that pull out into the street and sit in the middle of Congress, or they are forced to make a right turn and then do a U-turn, which is, again, creating a less safe condition. So what we attempted to do was to take a site that had unsafe conditions, because they're old and Congress has been expanded over the years, and make the site safer. And I think what Joaquin was looking at is whether we did that, whether the design that, that the architect provided made it a more safe design. And, and clearly, that is the case. Palm Beach County thought so. Their traffic engineering department thought so. Our expert traffic engineer also thought so. And the, the conditions that are there today, it is not safe. It is just not safe. It is not safe for the people that are going in and out of the property, and it's not safe for people that are going through the Germantown Road intersection because of the constraints of how it was designed. Um, could you push the building up? If you do that, you are creating an impediment to cars moving through out of the Germantown Road intersection. You are also encouraging cars on the north end of the site to try to use the median opening to exit to go southbound because it's too circuitous for them to come back, go around the building, and go out where the light is. So what was designed was the safest option short of removing the office buildings that are there. But, but, but could you do it in theory? You could do it. Is it as safe as what we've proposed tonight? Our traffic engineer does not think so. Um, your retail on the first floor, 1,085 square feet. I think it's 1,095, but 1,095. Yeah, on 1095. the first floor of the residential, right. yes. What is that exactly? What is that space? Um, it, it's going to be a form of retail. It can't be a restaurant for purposes of traffic, but it's going to be some form of a retail. Is there no way to have more retail on the first floor? Um, it, it, well, I mean, for a Hemrock site, we have 180,000 square feet of non-residential. We have a lot of non-residential. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason that we chose the retail in the middle building is because it is central, so you can draw from the two buildings to the you know north and south. Um, but the the this this code in Hemrock isn't again, as I said before artfully written, it was done in 2011 originally, and it doesn't say that, it doesn't specify the amount that you have on the first floor, it just has to be on the first floor, but 
Could it be more? I think if there was demand, they have the ability. There's only, I think, one residential unit on the first floor of that building. So there isn't really a strong presence of the residential at all. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking of something a little more vibrant at night in keeping with that vision of having uh, not just dark office buildings you know right no i understand like the reasons be for the cbd now the yeah. you know the other thing we were right. trying to be sensitive to was to not impact the intersection you know so some of the most vibrant uses particularly restaurant higher higher traffic uh, flow so we were trying to do something that meets the code but doesn't obviously negative Im negatively impact anything else it just seems like if you talk about live, work, play, I see living, I see work, I don't really see the play part there. Well, and, and MROC in general, the entire corridor is intended, they're intended to play off of each other. Mm -hmm. So for example, there's some discussion about a grocery store going in across the street. There's opportunity for that. The theory is that, you know, you start somewhere, you know, Mr. Kaufman, if, if, I don't know if he's still here. <laughs> um, his, his building is just office and self-storage. So, you know, they're providing the employment generating uses that the task force was looking for. This one has a combination. It has a couple. And is there any plan to expand on the office space? You've got a two-story and a four-story. If you get this project, or is there a plan to expand on that? I've, we've heard nothing but glowing statistics tonight about the demand for office and Class A space specifically. So I'm just wondering, is, is the final product eight stories all the way across? Um, from what my clients are, they're nodding no. Mm -hmm. So I think those buildings are of an age where it would be very hard to do that. You know, I suppose they could, we're only at 1.26, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, right. as far as FAR. Or area it was correct. Yeah. yeah, and you can go up to 2.5. So in theory, you could occupy more floor area and then build more structured parking. Oh, one thing that we were asked, that parking, by the way, is wrapped. So you don't see the parking and the parking structure from Congress. I think one of the residents asked that question, and I just wanted to answer it. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you. I'm ready. Ms. Morrison, please. So I know this site very well. Um, and every time I go there, there's so much parking that's empty. And now I see why. It's because the calculation is totally wrong. Uh, an, a typical office building with common area hallways, elevators, stairways, bathrooms, things like that, 20%. And they're only giving you 3%. Um, it looks like you're overparked by at least 300 spaces just for the office. Yes, so we did a public records request very early on to get the existing um, plans out of out of the building department, and it is old. It's over 40 years old. So uh, we couldn't find them. I did notice um, in Beth's latest report that they may have found one of the buildings of the two. I don't know. But we haven't seen those. So Beth and I had discussed, I think the staff report may say that, but you can check that. We discussed at, you know, in the event that the board should decide to proceed that a, a post-approval condition, we would actually do a much more detailed analysis. And if we can find the plans in the building department, it would be nice to operate off those. In the event that we can't, we can do some on-site analysis where we're actually going in and measuring buildings. But, you know, we have tenants in the space, so that's not the most convenient approach. But we can certainly fix that post, you know. So with all those excess parking spaces that you really don't need, you really could make the islands conforming. You really could. And you really could bulk up the landscaping and the curb appeal along Congress and Linton. It, it would be gorgeous sight to have beautiful trees along Congress Avenue. And without all this parking that you really don't need, you have the room, you've got the space, and you should have some extra money. Um, since, since the parking is going to be hopefully lessened, maybe there'll be some money left over so we can have some um, work for, more workforce housing or maybe a couple of affordable units in here too. Not low, low, not something that wouldn't be in can, keeping with the project, but certainly some affordable housing additional, which is what we really need. Um, so I am, this project is, is good. It's not perfect, it's good. It's needed, 
it's, it's needed, it's fitting, and it's timely. So if we could work through these few little quirks to get to the better project, um, I would be in favor of it if there were less parking, if all the islands meet, meet all criteria with no waivers for the islands, uh, increase landscaping and green areas and increase the curb appeal along the two major arteries of Linton and Congress. Um, uh, if you save on parking, add a few affordable units, please, and make more commercial space. Um, if you're going to have 181,000 square feet of office, that's what, 400 workers minimum, they have to eat, they have to have coffee, they've got to drop off their dry cleaning, they may have to get their hair done and their nails done. So if you could add more commercial space to make it a true live-work environment, I would be totally in favor of it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Morrison. Chair, do you mind if just take a minute? Um, you know, one thing, we had an extensive talk um, at the last meeting. Last meeting, yes. And the comments so far are going down the path that we had. But the applicant is meeting the land development regulations for affordable housing. Correct. And so we can announce our preference that there be more or that they be spread across, but it's, it should not be a basis that this board should rely upon for finding that the master development plan is not compatible or harmonious okay. or any of the other four findings for a waiver. So I didn't, I, I, didn't I know I, Maybe just, I wasn't listening as closely. <laughs> I didn't hear that. <laughs> no, but, nobody on the board has said that yet. No, but two members have mentioned affordable housing. Well, and they, had, they had five or six people march up here. Mr. Zell, express, hold on. Express the need in the city and the nation for affordable housing. They recognize it. We can't recognize it. There are plenty of other reasons not to, not to approve this, as Ms. Blankenship has already articulated. And I would encourage so you to rely upon yeah, those Wait for issues. me to make my comments, then you might be a little justified in, in uh, saying, don't base your whole decision on it. Well, Mr. Zeller? we don't have to base our Zeller? whole decision on it, but we can base a part of the decision on it because they totally ignored the comments that were made a month ago as to affordable housing. Mr. Yeah, they're Zeller? Yeah, have the minimum amount of affordable housing. It's all going to be, it's all going to be moderate income housing. They ignore the need that all these other people have already expressed for low and very low income housing as, as a mix, as we articulated Mr. Earlier. Zeller? But that's not the sole reason that people are upset about this project. Mr. Zeller? They are lumping. Can I ask you? Hold on a minute. I know you and Mr. Bennett are both attorneys, and I know you both hold strong opinions, but let's try to keep, let's try to treat each other well, and speak in we normal can. tones, okay? But and I hear what you're saying, I hear what you're saying, and I hear what Mr. Bennett's saying. Mr. Bennett is looking out for us legally, and I hear what you're saying. Okay. Okay? So, Mr. Zeller, Mr. Bennett, do you have anything else to add? No, I just, I just wanted to make sure that, that our record is clear about the reasons for denial and that they're based upon the findings that right. are in 247B5 and 245F5 and make sure that, that the board is clear no matter what decision they make this evening. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. Mr. Zeller. Okay. So aside from the failure of the applicant to address those comments of affordable housing, which, which we're not allowed to, to consider. They have addressed it, but go ahead. <laughs> I agree with the comments made by Ms. Blankenship that there are plenty of reasons that the LDRs have not been accommodated, that the concerns that were expressed at the last meeting were not accommodated, one of which is, is the continued need for at least four waivers, the uh, fact that this uh, design where they stick a tot lot off in some remote area so that the residents who are smack in the middle of this place have to cross, have to cross um, drive aisles to take their child to a tot lot. We're not talking about a baseball field, we're talking about tots. Should be a safe way for them not to have to cross that, but they 
chose not not to do that. So I don't believe that they're creating a safe situation with that. I don't believe that that uh, the granting of this <clears throat> does not result in a special privilege that the same waivers would be granted under similar uh, circumstances on on another property. I don't want to repeat what has already been been articulated, but but the intent of the ordinance with regard to putting in only 1,085 square feet of commercial space does not meet the intent of the ordinance. I think that that um, the elephant in the room is still the elephant of slapping in an eight-story building uh, on the corridor of Congress where such a significant high rise of a building, yes, it may be permitted, um, does, does not meet the intent of that, of that study, the Congress Avenue corridor. Um, I think that, that it's unfortunate that the applicant has, has refused to um, listen to the previous efforts that this board gave them to come back and, and make these plans more conforming, but they chose not to. Um, I frankly suspected they weren't going to. That's why I voted uh, against the uh, previous motion to, to continue this with direction because I didn't think they were going to follow direction, and that's exactly what has, has occurred here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zeller. Mr. Long. I think there's a feeling that the applicant is entitled to the height that they're requesting, and they are entitled to workforce housing that's proposed. So we really shouldn't even be talking about that, and I've heard it several times from my colleagues. You know, frankly, I agree with Ms. Morrison's comments I'm surprised that my, some of my colleagues are looking for reasons to say no to this project. We should be able to find, we should be finding a way to make it work. We have a dire need for housing. And by the way, most of the folks that came to speak about housing said housing. They didn't say low, low income housing. I agree, we also need that, but that's not what this is. And they're not required to supply that. So we shouldn't be hammering the applicant over that. It's unfair. That's not what we're here to vote on. And I've also heard several comments that the applicant came back and didn't address any nonconformities. That also isn't true. They addressed several nonconformities. They've addressed several nonconformities. I agree, if there is extra parking here, if they're overparked, then yes, we should definitely fix those, those, land, those islands. We should fix them, and we should add to the buffers if possible. I agree with that, but I'm not willing to hold up this project that has desperately needed housing over that, that's something that, they could, that we can figure out, that the commission can figure out. We need housing in this city, and this is where it belongs. This is a good project. Again, it's not perfect. I made the point last time, let's not make good, and let's not make perfect the enemy of good. This is a good project, and it's needed, and it's timely, like Ms. Morrison said. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Long. Anybody else? Yeah, I just have one sure. comment. Mr. Bennett. Can we have a definition of the granting of a special privilege as outlined in the LDRs? So the entire verbiage for the findings is does not result in the grant of a special privilege and that the same waiver will be granted under similar circumstances on other property for another applicant or owner. A further definition of that unfortunately is not expanded in the land, de land development regulations. Um, but you're talking about a privilege being granted to somebody and whether that same waiver would be granted to others that are asking for the same thing. And so in my view, um, respectfully, the 90-foot setback to make the center building equal to the two existing office buildings is the granting of a special privilege. Um, and that's expressly... Um, you know, it's something that is expressly in the LDRs for, you know, the, not to bank positive findings in relation to a granting of a special privilege. Um, I can't see another 
uh, project. It would be amazing to me if another project came in and wanted a master development plan with a 90-foot um, setback waiver in order to be in line with two existing buildings that you're trying to um, make fit in the middle. And so that's just my opinion. Thank you, Ms. Blankenship. Okay. Um, I'm going to make my comments now, unless you like to say anything, Mr. Weinberg? I'm good. You're good? Okay. <laughs> yeah. That's Fantastic. a first. <laughs> <laughs> no, it would be amazing if Mr. Zeller said that to me. <laughs> For you, right? Um, at any rate, let me just say um, that I do agree with Ms. Blankenship. Here's my problem with this project. You have 180,000 square feet of office space set between two buildings on two lots, okay? And now we're going to drop a 271-foot, eight-story building in between them. And maybe I'm incorrect, but Ms. Miskell, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, on the north side, there's less than 50 foot separation between the new office build, between the existing office building and the new apartment building. The south, there is, I believe, just over 50 feet of separation between the office building, the existing office building, and the new apartment building. We would never allow this type of massing on a site it's 12 acres, if this was going to be a brand new development. We would look at this, and that's another reason that I'm having a real problem with this. Because when you look at this site and you say, okay, all the building is concentrated in the, in the middle of the project, and parking is going to be to the rear, there's nothing being done on the Kaufman Lynn project, you don't even <laughs> see the tall cube smart building behind it. This, you're gonna have an eight story building, a four story building, and a two story building. In addition, the ceiling heights are about 12 and a half feet per floor in the office buildings. In this building that we're talking about, the apartment building, they're only gonna be allowing about 10 feet for, per floor which really is going to leave you with finished ceiling height of definitely less than nine feet because I can't see where you can get a structural slab, an HVAC, in less than a foot. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, my architect is saying that you may be wrong on that last I may be. That, that's fine. I'm willing to be corrected. Um, yes, and, sir. And, and by the way, what are the ceiling heights on the interior units in the apartment building? Usually, these type of buildings are actually done with a six-inch six slab between floors. And right. You end up with a nine-foot two, nine-foot four ceilings in the living room spaces, and the only areas where you drop the ceiling for below that is bathroom areas or where you have soffits where you have their AC. AC, right. But I'm saying if you have AC, you're definitely below nine feet, correct? In those areas, yes. Correct. Thank but you. The, but the, the unit itself, the majority of the unit, the bedroom space and the living room space, is above uh, nine feet. Okay, okay, right. But the point that I'm making, when you read our code, we're talking about building buildings with much higher ceilings, adaptive reuse. Also, if, you, if I looked at this project, you're making the open space, now you're meeting the standard, but the massing in the center of this project is so unbelievable. When you come down Germantown Road and you look at this, you're gonna have an eight-story building, a 50-foot building, and these are not small buildings. We would never allow this massing. Now, what we're trying to do is help out the applicant where we can. But as for a 90-foot setback, still keep all this surface parking. Okay, I mean, to me, if somebody seriously wanted this massing, they'd be coming in and going, okay, but here's what I've done. I'm structuring 90% of the parking and you got 35% open space. What I'm just saying is that on a compatibility 
standpoint and a concurrency standpoint. I cannot see any other structure like this along Congress Avenue or even in West Delray. And that's really what it comes down to. Ms. Miskell, please. Um, but do understand that the MROC allows more than double what we are proposing as far as FAR. So mm -hmm. you could, in theory, have buildings that are bigger than this building. It just happens that we're not looking for that. We did not max out there. We did not max out on the height. There, your code doesn't have any minimum requirements as far as distance separation. In fact, the SAD across the street establishes lesser separation between their buildings than we have, and we're immediately to the east of them. So Right, but, we, that, but that's also a special activities district. That is not MROC zone. No, but okay? even under MROC, they would have been allowed. As a matter of fact, the reason that they put it in their SAD regulations is under MROC, there would have zero limitation other than the fire code. The I, fire code is a What I'm just going to say is that I believe, and I may be mistaken, that the Kaufman Lynn Project has a higher FAR than this project due to a smaller lot size, and the mini storage in the back. However, when you drive past that site, you don't even realize the floor area ratio would be of that size because most people don't even see the cube smart building to the back. And that's the point that I'm making. The massing on that site is handled in a much different manner. Okay, they have a two story building in Kaufman Lynn's headquarters with an artistic facade on it. And behind it is, I don't know, 60 foot, I don't know what the exact height of it is, cube smart building. But to most people, they don't even see that massing. So the point that I'm making is that, in my opinion, when I look at this project, more effort would certainly have been put into minimizing the parking and not just that structuring more of it okay, in a way that would be hidden. And if the green space was enhanced dramatically to the north and south of the two existing office buildings, you're getting rid of what green space is in the middle where the apartments building is going. But that would certainly go a long way toward softening this project, in my opinion. Um, but comments were made at our last meeting we are where we are here. Let me just be honest, this project will not be getting my support tonight. Make a motion. Ms. Blankenship. Move denial of a master development plan for Delvery Central, located at 1615 and 1625 South Congress Avenue, associated with the addition of an eight-story building containing 1,095 square feet of non-restaurant commercial use and 271 residential units, including a parking structure and amenities, finding that the request, inclusive of the waivers, is not consistent with the comprehensive plan and does not meet the applicable criteria set forth in the land development regulations. Second. Second by Ms. Howell. Ms. Miller? Please Mom clarify Mom? that a, a yes vote would be a denial. That's correct. Correct. That's correct. Rob Long? No. Joy Howell? Yes. Helen Zeller? I vote yes to deny. Christina Morrison? No to deny. Max Weinberg? No. Julian Blankenship? Yes. Chris Davey. Yes. Let the record show the motion carried four to three and passed. Ms. Biskel, thank you. Ms. Issa, thank you. Thank you. And by the way, I want to apologize for keeping you here this late. You shouldn't have been last. <laughs> Ms. Alvarez. Good evening again. You're coming up to tell us the June meeting's been canceled. <laughs> well, 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 no, didn't we just Mr. continue Bennett's laughing item? at that one. <laughs> Can we get that in the motion? <laughs> well, it was going to be canceled until you continued an item to that <laughs> meeting. So, uh, no, just uh, June 20th, definitely not canceled. <laughs> 
regardless of what happened tonight, June, July 18th, also definitely not canceled. We've got items for that one as well. And then just a reminder, at our last meeting, we talked about our meeting change in September. So um, it was determined that September 12th would be the best. 9-12? Um, yep. So. 19? Um, Correct. 919 City Commission uh, is meeting on that date. That's our chairman. Right. They, okay. they took our meeting. So we'll just go a week <laughs> earlier. Okay. <laughs> that way we can work on our planning and zoning board package, get it out to you all before. Um, but wait a minute. You then have to Labor get it Day. out like before Labor Day. Right. Yeah. But then yeah. the week of Labor Day, we don't have to worry about it. Yeah, nothing. <laughs> don't you? Wait a minute. Relax. Don't, wouldn't you have to come in then on Labor Day and work? No. <laughs> 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 oh, they call it Labor Day. No. What's with August? Is there an August? There is an August meeting. I just um, don't have it on the, uh, the, the specific radar yet. Give me a second. 15th. Yes, I could have figured it out. Thank you. Okay. When was that September date? I'm sorry. September is the 12th. 12th, okay. Yep. And then on August the, is the 15th, I think. I'm sorry? Yes, August correct. The 15th. August 15th, oh. yes. And then, um, yeah. I usually just do two months in advance, but... Um, Yep, but those are our summer dates. And um, as always, keep Diane up to date on any absences, conflicts, and your attendance. And I think that's all I've got. You got it. Mr. Bennett? Nothing from me, thanks guys. Really? Nothing yeah. <laughs> from me, thanks guys. We burned him out tonight. <laughs> okay, that's good, we're all set. Oh, Every I want to talk about one thing. Oh, sure, please. Uh, meeting I noticed that Max was talking about that we needed a zoning criteria for cottage communities. Mm -hmm. We already have a cottage community and this is it. I showed it to him the last time. Yeah, yeah, yeah I showed it to him. I showed it to him the last time. Yeah. I know, yeah. We already have it. It's part of the... Um, and it's already, pri it's already priced for workforce housing, oh, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> it could be built a little differently to be workforce housing. <laughs> mm -hmm. These are all tricked out. There. I know. I showed it to him on Pop at the end oh, of the okay. last meeting. It's 16 homes on 1.3 acres. Um, Designed by one of our local architects, Roger Cope, easy to to you know c configure into a smaller lot on northwest, southwest, southeast, northeast, wherever you want it. So it's already existing in the M zone, mm -hmm. multifamily zone. This is radically. I don't want to get into a whole discussion. This is nothing similar. I went down there to check it out after Chris mentioned it. This is nothing, with due respect at all like what I was proposing. Really? Wait a minute, were you, Nothing. Pro were you proposing the stripped down version? Yeah, the non-beachfront version? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is actually, it's nice. Very nice. There is, there, but, but you it's not a... You weren't looking for the 1,500 per square well, foot version? Yeah. <laughs> I can give you a very short update. <laughs> if, you, uh, if you want, I can give you a short, so... Yeah, this is not at all what I had in mind. Uh, but uh, I, uh, we had a very productive meeting with uh, uh, Anthea, Lynn Jellen, uh, Renee Jadising, um about this very about the proposal. There is a there is an appetite to create an actual zone that would allow uh, for the pocket neighborhood. Uh, this doesn't, uh, this is a very creative use of uh, a sliver of land. Uh, on the ocean. Yeah, on the ocean, yeah. Uh, but the, uh, uh, this wouldn't satisfy the affordable housing element that I proposed. And there, there currently is, so there is an appetite for the city to investigate this. There's an appetite <laughs> for the CRA to uh, look at their various sites um, and have it be, you know, really affordable. Um, but it would take the initiative, part of it would be the initiative of this board to propose that the commission look at creating a new zone uh, in wherever they, you know, wherever they wanted to do it. The CRA would like to see the area around uh, North and Southwest 6th. There's several lots in there. Um, 
it's a it's not as simple as as, as snapping your fingers and you got a new zone um, in terms of the uh, procedures that go along but it's a good idea along with we discussed the uh, uh, the granny flats mm -hmm. to relieve some of the housing stresses um, so the, you know it uh, uh, it may not happen in the first thousand days. It may not happen in the life of this planning board, but there is a uh, uh, an appetite to look at to look at that because there is no zone, uh, a residential zone that uh, would cover anything less than seventy five hundred square feet for a single family residence. Right. So, isn't Pulte this Pulte this is like very this is great. This couldn't be built today. Under our current uh, zoning, and uh, and these are definitely not af classified as affordable housing. I don't know, but they could yeah. be modified. Well, yeah, they have to be modified. Like, they're tricked out. Well, and then you don't have. Yeah, to well, like I said, there there's a there's a bit of an appetite to. Why don't to you ask the, cha the chairman to at, have it added to the time. agenda for yeah, a meeting? Time time. Yeah. We'll yeah, one. can I propose yes. even a task force? He's not listening. He's not listening. So, uh, you know, it, uh, the, to look at this, to, to make a recommendation to the city commission to really look at this seriously. And uh, they were talking about hiring a, uh, a consultant to come in. Uh, the uh, information that I gave everybody, and I have more information now, uh, there, there was actually a, a process and a protocol in place to help municipalities do this, uh, and uh, uh, it's a it's a program. So you know the consultant work, I wouldn't say it's completely done, but uh, certainly along the way. You know, I would like to buy one of the. I'd like to buy the one that's right on the beach. <laughs> five million dollars. But I have a feeling the it's one not on the within beach is five million. What? The one on the beach was five million. Five million dollars. Yeah. So. You know, in line with the affordable affordability issue, I'm not exactly the sure one, that's the Mr. one. On, wait a minute, the one that's on A one A that was low low. It was low low. Yeah, <laughs> low, low. it was only a million. It was only two and a half million. No, you uh, sold for a million. You that's a you know, uh, but oh, let's go. Anyway, that's that's sort of the state of it. It would depend on. On, on us to really kind of dig into that and, uh, you know. It's, uh, Why don't we ask the chair to add it to the agenda? Well, if, if, yes. I, if I can before we move can forward. Can you add it to the agenda, Mr. Chairman? If, Hold on, if, I think Amy I can, would like to speak. Add it to the well, agenda. Before we add something to the agenda, um, this in, entire topic and effort is something that we are looking at seriously, not just, oh, yeah, we need to do that. Um, and we have we have looked at talking to uh, different consultants and trying to get somebody on board to work on this. So it is a topic that will be coming before you because as we have have uh, you know either a draft plan or draft recommendations, you know more discussions. Yes, but I think at this point it would be a little bit too preliminary to put something specific on the agenda, particularly when we have. Agendas like this coming yeah, forward for the, the next couple of months. And we're still trying um, to bring the LDRs in compliance with the new comp plan. Oh, yes. I mean, you know, <laughs> not for nothing. Motion to adjourn? Yes. <laughs> yes. We're going to adjourn, this, Diane? Absolutely, absolutely. I'm going to adjourn, okay? Thank you, Thank you all tonight for tonight. Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs>